good evening everyone sorry good morning good afternoon good morning and good evening to places from our people watching here from all over the world and asia pacific uh, this is the uh, asia pacific uh, spine society webinar in association with ortho tv to introduce today's topic and the speaker i hand over to dr vishal kudnani thank you neeraj uh, on behalf of the education committee of asia pacific spine society i welcome all of you to this wonderful webinar series conducted online by asia pacific spine society and uh, welcome to the new year of education last year we had successful four webinar programs attended by more than 5000 delegates across the globe and i'm sure this coming year also we are going to see educational activities conducted under the ags of august meeting of asia pacific spine society we are going to have fruitful interactive scientific discussion to to satisfy uh, the the quest of academics in spine surgery without much ado may i welcome upon for the welcome address our honorable president of asia pacific spine society dr s rajashekaran sir please yeah so thank you vishal uh, for the introductory remarks so i would like to welcome all the delegates and the faculty for the very first of the series of uh, these webinars for 2022 so i think this is going to be a great program because if you look at uh, the last year's records this program has been hugely successful and uh, there has there were four webinars with 18 apss faculty members and six apss case presenters and what was very interesting was that every one of these sessions overran the 120 minute sessions with very interactive discussions and uh, deliberations and also with the uh, streaming hosted by ortho tv we have been able to get more than 5800 views live and post live so that's really commendable and i think that i should congratulate on behalf of apss the education subcommittee led by vishal and his core members chiket and kenny kwan so big congratulations to all of you and thank you kaylin for organizing the whole thing and for today's uh, meeting we again have i think this year we are going to concentrate last year it was cervical spine and this year we are going to concentrate on uh, deformities another very important topic which i am sure will attract uh, more number of viewers uh, this year so i would like to welcome all the faculty members for today dr lim from singapore jason from hong kong professor yang from taiwan dr banu from japan professor hiki twong from singapore kenny kwan from hong kong ajay shetty from india and dr chung from malaysia and all stellar speakers with great experience in spine surgery and i'm sure that they'll bring a very good insight into the topics that are going to be discussed so i would be failing in my duty if i don't thank our industrial partner metronic with the, who have been a great support in supporting these uh, webinars so thank you metronic last but not the least i would also like to take this opportunity to invite all of you to check out on the apss annual meeting 2022 now this is going to be quite different from the meetings which we have had so far because more than 60% of the time is going to be occupied by live operative course and the dates for this meeting is from 10th to 12th of june the website is already on the abstract submission is till the 15th of march and this is a hybrid meeting and i just saw in the papers today that many more countries in the asia pacific have lifted the travel bans so singapore and uh, two other countries have lifted the travel bans today so by june i am sure that all of you will be able to travel and we are looking forward to all of you to participate uh, physically which is our first preference but at least uh, as a hybrid and we are looking forward for a great meeting so please check out the website is open and the abstract submission is also open so thanking all of you and our industrial partner metronic i hand over back to vishal for a very successful meeting thank you thank you dr rajeshekran sir for wonderful motivating words to all of us and i on behalf of apss online committee and education team 
I welcome all the faculty members and all the delegates for this wonderful meeting, which is the first of the four webinars that are going to be dedicated to only spine deformity this year. Of course, the basics of spine will be covered in other parts of the of the webinars that will be coming up through APSS. But these four webinars, which are purely concentrating on spinal deformity, part one being the AIS, the more commoner form of scoliosis. The part two, which will be in another quarter in three months from now, is going to have a little more difficult and challenging aspect of spinal deformity, including neurofibromatosis, congenital deformity, spinal scoliosis of uh, syndromic nature, and various other aspects of complex spinal deformity. And the part three uh, would have uh, oversight on kyphosis, complications, and osteotomies. And part four, again, in the last quarter of the year, you're going to see far more interesting aspects uh, of spinal deformity. Today, we are going to have next 120 minutes, which are not only going to be new, but unique in the form of various country faculty members, the who's who in scoliosis coming together on one single platform to share the experience, bring the insights from evidence, but also to bring forward the subjective dilemmas that everyone faces across. With us, we have faculty members from Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia, and of course, all the panel members, including Dr. Rajeshekaran sir himself, along with the executive committee of APS is joining us for very interesting interactive case discussion formats, which are going to be led by our moderators, Shikid and Kenny Kwan. Without much ado, may I now hand over to our moderators to please bring forward the most anticipated spinal deformity discussion on AIS part one. Shikid and Kenny Kwan, over to you, please. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Vishal. Uh, I'm Kenny Kwan from Hong Kong. Uh, so, uh, welcome you all to join our uh, webinar today on adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. So, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Lok Lim Lau, who is my good friend from uh, Singapore, from NUH. Uh, he's going to talk about classification systems, Kings versus Lenke. Where are we heading? So, Lok Lim, over to you. Good day to all. I would like to thank the APSS for the invitation to this webinar. I'm tasked with this topic on the classification of scoliosis. Ponsetti and Friedman were the first to describe it in 1950s. The classification was primitive and descriptive. However, it served the purpose of prognosticating the curve progressions. In 1983, King published the first classification to guide scoliosis treatment, which was named after him almost 30 years after Harrington Rod was invented. The classification recognizes thoracic curve, thoracolumbar curve, and lumbar curve at the coronal plane. It guides the segmenter by planar instrumentation system, leaky rod, and sublaminar wiring, which was popular at the time. The radiograph shows one patient who had such instrumentation at the time. King classification, however, has very limited curve patterns, with no consideration for sagittal and axial planes. The risk of coronal decompensation in type 2 curve was particularly high at 60%. We now know the reasons, as this corresponds to a few subtypes recognized to us as Lenke 1C, 3C, 5C, and 6C. Triplanar instrumentation system using hooks and rods, which were introduced in early 1980s classification system. In 2001, Lenke classification as we know it was published. It has six major curve types. It divides the thoracic curve into proximal thoracic curve and main thoracic curve, in addition to the thoracolumbar lumbar curve. Each of the curve can be major or minor curve. The minor curve can be structural or non-structural based on dynamic side bending x-rays. It accounts for the lumbar curve behavior over the central sacral vertical line, an extension of the concept of Harrington stable zone. It also accounts for the sagittal alignment, recognizing that hypothoracic curve may be present in many type 1 curves. At the same time, it also recognizes that the structural curve may arise from the sagittal plane. This represented a major advancement from the King classification. As a result, the curve patterns can be very complicated, with 42 curve types identified. The concern from such a complex system is whether it is reliable among different observers or even same observer at different time points. Multiple studies by multiple authors in multiple different populations over the years 
had shown good inter and intra observer reliability. Lumber modifier was the one parameter noted to have poorer reliability by an author. The classification is treatment directed. Major curves are included in the arthrodesis. Non structural minor curves are excluded from the arthrodesis. The percentage of rule breakers ranges from 30% to as high as 46%. Clement et al. looked at the percentage of rule breakers before and after lengthy classification was introduced. He found an improvement with less rule breakers found in all curve patterns except in lengthy 4. So what are the shortfalls of the lengthy classification? Where are we heading now? The beauty of the simplicity is often what our minds are seeking. Lanky classification lacks the simplicity of the King classification and misses out the 1AR curve type described by Newton et al. This was well recognized by King classification type 4. Our group identified the risk of adding on in lanky 1 and 2 curves at 6%. 6 of the 9 patients with adding on had 1AR curve type a subtype worth noting in any classification system. A classification system should be comprehensive. Lanky classification although recognizes proximal thoracic curve, it does not account for proximal thoracic curve as the primary curve pattern as shown in this case. This patient has proximal thoracic curve measuring 70 degrees with raised both medial and lateral shoulder on the left side. Of note, he had otherwise normal MRI findings. The proximal thoracic curve is a major curve. The main thoracic curve is a minor non-structural curve. Selective fusion was done recently in this case. None of the classification is perfect. Misclassification is a potential pitfall. According to Lenke classification, the apex of the curve is at T11, T12 and measure 59 degrees. This should then be classified as lengthy 1C curve. But of course, the behavior of the curve resembles that of a 5C curve. The measurement went according to what one would do for a 5C curve as in this case. The often forgotten plane is the axial plane. This is not accounted for in the lengthy classification. This may explain the post-op adding on in some cases. Some patients may present with predominant axial deformity with relative benign cop angle, such as shown in the case on the right side. How do we quantify the axial plane deformity in an erect position quickly? They can be quantified by Pajoli's torsion meter as shown in here. It is less popular now in the digital age as there is no digital version of it. The structural component of a minor curve is determined by bending radiographs. Dr. Lenke did not define how this was obtained other than by using side bending radiographs. The threshold is set at 25 degrees in arbitrary number. There are variations among practicing surgeons in the interpretations of this that ranges from getting the falcon bending radiographs to the halo femoral traction radiographs when adopting the definitions. While there are variations in practice among surgeons, a lower threshold may be required when selective fusion is selected. Dr. Guan's paper pushes this Rinder number down to 15 degrees in lengthy 5C curve in his decision to perform selective fusion. In the management of neglected idiopathic curves that exceed 100 degrees, lengthy classification invariably will suggest fusion of all curves, which will mean arthrodesis from T2 to L4 at least. This case study shows exactly such a situation. The empty curve was 140 degrees, that bends to 99 degrees. The proximal thoracic curve and the lumbar curves are both structural. But if you look deeper, you may find the classification of large curve of more than 100 degrees by Dr. Boachi useful. This is a 1CS curve, which is in here. It is the most common subtype of large curves which has both coronal and sexual curvature of more than 100 degrees. The curve patterns may change into less severe subtype for interactions. Now the same patients underwent anterior surgery followed by five days of tractions, reduces the empty curves on 140 degrees to 80 degrees. 
and lumbar curves from 80 degrees to close to 40 degrees. With this selective fusion from T2 to L2, breaking the rules suggested by Lenke classification, the patient was able to bend over to touch the floor two years after surgery, as shown in here. After recounting all the potential pitfalls of Lenke classification system, what is the aim of the classification? The aim is to classify and separate scoliosis patterns to predict the natural history. Furthermore, it should guide the practitioners in terms of treatment to achieve good outcomes, be it patient-centric, surgeon-centric, or in the prevention of adverse outcome. It allows a universal language to communicate among practitioners. Is there a better way to describe and classify the three-dimensional spinal deformity? Having had uniplanar classification seen in King's and biplanar classification seen in Lenke's, the requisite of a more detailed classification is that it must account for all the planes of the deformity. Geometric torsion is one of the ways to describe the three-dimensional deformity. It measures the helicoidal deviations of the vertebrae. Interestingly, it was published at the same time as Lenke's classifications. The rather abstract presentation did not gain much traction among orthopedic surgeons. The SRS 3D classification company was formed in attempts to make 3D classification more intuitive. By planar radiographs can be obtained with slot scanning machine to acquire AP and lateral views simultaneously. A composite top-down view, also called Da Vinci projection, is created to map each of the vertebra from T1 to T12, as shown in here. The Da Vinci projection is very similar to the top-down view of the 3D reconstruction from the slot scanning EOS machine. You have orange line that representing the lumbar region, green line that representing the main thoracic region, blue line that representing the proximal thoracic region. This is then transposed to Da Vinci representation, where the submission of the vectors of each region is then taken. The vector for lumbar region, for example, sum up the coronal cop angle and physiological sagittal cop angle at that region. The AP view of these radiographs may look very similar. In the lateral radiographs, the patient on the left has classical hypokyphotic thoracic spine, while the patient on the right has hyperkyphotic thoracic spine. With the Da Vinci representation, the difference is made apparent. The green vector of the Da Vinci representation is more horizontal in direction for the patient with hypokyphotic thoracic spine, while the green vector is comparatively more vertical and pointing posteriorly for the hyperkyphotic thoracic spine. With different machine learning methods, different authors have come up with distinct curve patterns recognized by machine without prior assumption, and this ranges from 5 to 11 curve types. Without doubt, 3D classification allows more thorough descriptions of the deformity. Semi-automatic unsupervised classifications improves both the inter- and intra-reader reliability. The disadvantages are listed. In summary, King classification is the first uniplanar classification that guides the treatment. Lange classification is the mainstay by planar classification with a number of deficiencies. 3D classification is at the infancy stage that we are heading towards now. Currently and for the immediate future, Lange classification is going to be supplemented by other subclassification, including large curve classification and 3D classifications. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lau. Yeah. So I think um, I still, we, we haven't received any uh, Q&A from the floor. Maybe we'll, I'll start off with some question. So do, do you think that we should still use King's classification or should we just move on to Lanky or yeah, or we should we use both? I think uh, King is uh, outdated now, right? So we are, most people will be using Lanky now, right? isn't it? 
So the question, of course, is that whether we should move on to 3D classification or not. Uh, 3D classification is quite complicated and the planes accounted for, even though it's extra, of course, the combination that we have, you know, expanded from 42 patterns that you see in Lanky that can go to hundreds of types. And then, of course, you rely on the machine learning and also you rely on some processes that can auto automatically uh, sieve them out to different patterns. So at this juncture, uh, 3D classification is probably still too complicated for most people. And so my, my view is that Lanky is going to be uh, the mainstay uh, classification uh, system for foreseeable future uh, until the machine learning algorithm and also the usage caught up. Yeah, thanks. Um, maybe an another question. Um, uh, what what are the uh, you highlighted that there's some deficiency in Lenke's classification? Uh, can you uh, highlight it again? Uh, so, uh, which are the components of Lenke classification that you think may be uh, slightly deficient in your uh, surgical management strategies? I think I, I draw it to a few deficiency area. Right, one is that uh, the the Lenke classification must help the surgeon to build a biomechanical stable spine, right? So it must be comprehensive as well. Comprehensive is that uh, they must uh, able to help us to overcome all sort of uh, situation in AIS uh, that satisfy the uh, indication for surgery. And also must able to handle the extreme of the situation, meaning that large curve situation. So, so I think I highlighted in, in the talk uh, is that number one, uh, Lenke uh, somehow did not capture a uh, situation where the proximal uh, thoracic curve is the primary curve pattern. And you look at the extreme situation, right? They are not able to guide you too much as well. And so you look at the, the axial plane, which is a very important plane. In fact, and some author feels that uh, the axial plane is probably the driving force of the uh, progression of scoliosis. Uh, currently, it's not well accounted for, except uh, in the uh, almost like after after thought, uh, in terms of uh, in in terms of uh, doing a selective fusion, there are certain rules which are published subsequently to supplement the original classifications. So so I think uh, for time being, um, uh, all these deficiencies uh, are there, and uh, is for the practitioner surgeon to be aware of. And last but not least, is also the uh, misclassification. Uh, that means that in the, the rules are quite rigid. Uh, also uh, in terms of the uh, flexibility of the uh, minor structural curve which is a huge uh, problem uh, because uh, when you face with one C curve, for example, uh, whether you should go all out and fuse the non-structural curve as well it is uh, something that the classification system uh, is not able to guide us too much. So it, it comes to a situation that we have, uh, you know, you follow the rules versus you don't follow the rules. So you, you have to assess that and see following the rules will give you more mileage or uh, breaking the rules will give you more mileage. Lockliff, I've noticed you haven't touched on the uh, sagittal classification that France has popularized. And actually, recently, I know some of them actually don't follow the Lenke classification in terms of fusion because of uh, the sagittal malalignment. Now, uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, Geneve uh, Leon uh, uh, published that uh, paper uh, in the sagittal classification of the uh, AIS. And currently, I think it's still very early stage uh, in terms of the characterization. And the population is study uh, currently, there are two uh, paper, main paper. One is from the France, the other one is from the, uh, from the States, uh, Texas. So if you look at them uh, closely, the sexual plane is not so easily understood. And to, to put it into that few uh, profiles uh, that uh, Genevieve uh, has put, put forth, uh, I think currently is still early stage. I think the, the guidance should come from 3D. It means the 3D will be able to sieve that out more thoroughly. And being a three-dimensional deformity is very different from the, um, in the adult deformity or in the, uh, in, in the uh, understanding of the sagittal profile using normal population where the spine is straight. The 3D uh, itself will give us uh, more information. Currently, basing on the scoliosis firm to, to classify them, I think we have to go on the hyperplane. It means that the current... Uh, understanding bounds by our, our uh, limitation uh, uh, by the x-rays. Hyperplane is really in the realms of mathematics in order to get a better view. So I think uh, still early st stage uh, in terms of sagittal uh, classification. 
we also have another question from uh, Professor Wong, uh, He Kip Wong. Uh, he wants to ask you whether you think future classification should take into account of overcorrection in selective fusions to achieve a balanced spine. Well, this certainly is a, a good question. Uh, overcorrection uh, is, of course, um, it's, it's an issue. So that's why, you know, I talk about the flexibility, how you determine the flexibility uh, of the non-structural curve. The number one aim of any correction, of course, is uh, to correct uh, the curve, uh, which is harmonious and straight. And let's say you can't achieve that, right? Then at least uh, achieve a harmonious spine. So I think uh, currently the, uh, the, our instrumentation system is getting stiffer. And also uh, in terms of correction, invariably we will make the correction more. And when you do a selective fusion, it's very important then to achieve a harmonious spine, which is uh, not an easy art, you know, given the situation. So I think certainly there's a room to, to improve in that uh, uh, regards. So that's why uh, I think flexibility, which currently uh, 25 degrees is the random number that we use to, to assess that flexibility. And uh, we have to take into that consideration uh, in terms of how much our curve uh, uh, can, you know, in the, uh, the understanding of the uh, non-structural curve, how much this correction is matched to that, uh, which is very important. Maybe a very quick question. I think uh, Dr. Vishal has uh, asked in the chat group, do you think modern classification, despite being comprehensive, are not objective in suggesting fusion levels, which currently is more subjective, particularly in type C curves? Yeah, so the, it's currently, uh, you know, there are many rules out there and uh, it's really uh, based on the practitioners. So there are a lot of rule breakers, isn't it, uh, in a lot of situations that uh, a lot of surgeons may not follow the rules suggested by Lenke. So I think in the future, hopefully we can have a machine learning uh, algorithm that not only classifying all the curves, also look at how the surgeon's experience and the curve uh, pattern, and also the, uh, the, uh, the method implants that we use, the stiffness, the rods, and the techniques. So you can build our profile and that certainly can guide us, uh, you know, if let's say we use certain uh, way of doing things, we can have more uh, consistent outcome. So yes, I think uh, currently is uh, uh, quite subjective. Thank you very much. Uh, I think because, uh, because of time limitation, there are still more questions in the chat box. So maybe uh, Dr. Lau, you can address them uh, by uh, uh, the chat box. We will proceed with the next speaker and the program. Thank you very much, Dr. Lau. Okay, the next uh, uh, speaker will be Dr. Jason on decision-making in management of scoliosis, bracing versus surgery. I'd like to thank APSS for um, inviting me to give this talk on decision-making in management of scoliosis, bracing versus surgery. Now, we all know that bracing for AIS is well-established. Um, in this uh, landmark paper, they've shown that 72% uh, of brace treatment is successful to avoid surgery if uh, in fact uh, there's adequate compliance. Both SRS and SOSART have agreed that a cob angle of around the moderate range, 20 to 40 degrees is uh, indicated for brace treatment. Uh, and we know that it definitely does prevent uh, curve progression. But we have seen uh, in the previous papers that uh, uh, knowing the uh, amount of cob angle at the initial stage as well as the uh, maturity status do give us good predictability of poor outcomes as well as uh, positive outcomes as you see in the later slides. Uh, what we want to aim for brace treatments to avoid patients of reaching the 40 degree threshold in which uh, they have a risk of adulthood progression as well as the 50 degree uh, threshold which is uh, what we normally use as the uh, guidelines for surgical uh, indications. Now we've shown in this paper that uh, those cases with uh, a smaller degree uh, curvature, you may uh, be able to watch a bit longer before you start bracing them. But at those uh, with a uh, moderate to near severe curves, such as 35 degree range, uh, you probably want to brace them even if the patient is a bit more mature. Uh, as you can see in this graph, uh, those who are more than 35 degrees more mature have a very high progression risk uh, to reaching both the 40 and 50 degrees threshold, and you probably want to brace them a bit uh, more aggressively. 
However, the main uh, topic that I'm going to be ta uh, speaking about today is the dilemma for those who are really at the moderate severe uh, range, which, are, which means the curves are reaching 40 degrees or more. Uh, we know from biomechanical studies that uh, the brace has uh, difficulties in imparting enough forces onto the spine to correct the curvature and control these curvatures. And we also know from natural history study that uh, patients with curves of order, more than 40 degrees will probably progress in the adulthood. We also want to avoid prolonged use of brace treatment because that can lead to poor body images, um, osteoporosis, uh, pain, self poor self-esteem, and also worse quality of life. So we really only, only want to brace when it's really indicated. So in this, type, in this group of patients with 40 degrees or more curves, what should we actually do? Should we brace them? As you can see in this patient, a 12-year-old girl with thoracic curve, uh, successfully um, uh, managed with a brace, and you can see the curve was stable at the end of uh, growth. Or in such case where you brace them for two to three years and subsequently there is progression and this patient ultimately underwent surgery, or should we just go ahead from the first stage and perform surgery, either vertebral body tethering or post spinal fusion right from the start? Now we know from uh, our post weaning data that even if we have uh, good control, all of these patients uh, throughout the brace period, if they still maintain to be more than 40 degrees at the time of brace weaning, they will still undergo further progression post weaning. As you can see in this one case of 89 patients, uh, who are braced at, who are stopped bracing at maturity still pr continue to progress in the over 40 degree uh, curve group. Uh, similarly, you can see here, this is another study looking at specifically a standard stage 7B, which is uh, essentially quite mature patients. Uh, those patients who have curve progressions in this cohort, 41.4% uh, were actually large curves. If you look at this graph, uh, you can see that uh, those patients who have less than 40 degree curves at the time of brace weaning generally do not have curve progression post uh, weaning if you have weaned them at appropriate age. However, even if you have weaned them at a, at a stage of maturity, a lot of these patients still continue to progress if they have a more than 40 degree curve. Some may ask, Maybe you want to delay the, uh, the, uh, the surgical treatment. Um, patients may have a, a lot of reasons for not uh, choosing a surgery at a younger age. They want to actually try to give a period of brace weaning just, just for the sake of trying. Um, in this one study, they've shown that actually in uh, 35 uh, patients who um, had more than 40 degree curves, subsequently uh, uh, underwent bracing and they actually had more than 10 degree curve progression. And in most of these patients, they actually have increased number of fusion levels uh, per the lengthy guideline. So if patients have curve progressions, uh, you would expect them to have require more levels to be fused. And of course, this is not uh, what we're hoping to gain from uh, delaying uh, patients for surgery. But there is uh, the other side of the spectrum. So we have seen in some studies that there are a chance of curve regression. Right? So this is a large cohort study that uh, I've conducted um, two years ago, uh, looking at our brace cohort. Uh, and we found that actually 17% of our brace population do undergo curve regression. So that's reduction of a significant amount of curve uh, uh, cob angle of more than six degrees. And we found that in these patients, they're generally higher flexibility and correction uh, in the brace and increased apical ratio, which I'll show you um, what I mean in the next slide. And we found that these changes uh, are static up to two years post brain brace weaning. So we've seen in these patients with curve regression, at the, as you can see in the top, uh, patients with uh, some wedging of the vertebrae actually regain some um, uh, morphological changes uh, with time. Um, those who have progression develop more wedging, those who have regression develop less wedging. And uh, we have found this to be a significant factor to um, predict whether a patient will have uh, uh, regression or not. Uh, so this is one case example of a patient uh, on the left, uh, initial x-ray prior to bracing and subsequent to, uh, to brace weaning at two years follow-up with uh, regress curve. So does this, does this actually happen in most of our patients in 40 degrees and has this been validated? So we've seen uh, 
from uh, Stefano Negrini's group that uh, of a large, very large uh, group of patients who looked at specifically large curves who refused surgery. So in their cohort, they looked at 45 to 60 degree curve range. Uh, they found that actually patients who are generally quite compliant to full-time brace wear for a prolonged period of times, uh, over four years, do gain some improvements of uh, a significant amount over five degrees. And they have found an average improvement of 9.3 degrees, um, specifically a better results in the lumbar curve um, as we expect because they are more flexible. Uh, they follow up with study with a prospective uh, cohort looking at um, a patient cohort of uh, average 52.5 degrees, but they actually looked at uh, curves up to 93 degrees at a various uh, uh, um, range of uh, RISR sign. Um, they looked at patients who are full-time bracing for at least five years. Uh, so they have a compliance rate of an average of 94%. And they found that actually quite a number, high, large number of these patients do have a reduction in the curve size. So 61.5% um, of the group reduced to un below 45 degrees and actually even 15.4% uh, reduced to below 35 degrees. So in, in this code, they found the patients who are highly compliant with prolonged treatment may actually have uh, uh, curve regression. Uh, this, uh, another paper from the Chinese group uh, showed that similarly, they found that patients who were braced um, between the 40 and 45 degree group do have a significant amount of patients who have improvement in the curvature after brace weaning. How about our own data? So uh, I specifically looked at uh, a bunch of patients who had a uh, call bang of more than 40 degrees, uh, initial age of presentation and brace uh, initiation at around 11 years old. Most of these uh, curves are lumbar curves, just to, just to let you know, because I think uh, we generally try to be more aggressive with lumbar curve because uh, we want to avoid um, fusions if possible. Uh, Pre-brace, uh, Carb angle was an average of 45 degrees. And at the end of uh, treatment, at two years follow-up, we found a regression of only 3%, but quite a large number of these do progress. Now, using uh, this data as um, for a multivariate analysis, we found that the flexibility rate is probably one of the key uh, contributors. So we found a 26.3% flexibility for those who regressed, uh, less flexible for those who progressed. And uh, patients who are actually older, post menarche uh, at the time of brace uh, initiation, risk of sign of more than zero, zero. So at least a triradial closure or beyond may actually have a higher chance of regression. So this boils down to two main predictors for brace treatment outcomes, so flexibility and maturity. Uh, we've seen in previous studies that those who progress generally are thoracic curves with a lower flexibility rate, all right? So we've seen in this study that supine flexibility rate of less than 20%, Will lead to progression, while those are more than 28% flexibility and uh, higher uh, and an equal correction rate, um, as well as lumbar curves, will generally have regression. Next is talking about the maturity. All right, so we understand from the growth pattern that there's the area of peak height velocity is probably the highest risk of curve progression. If we break down in this study into the ob observation brace groups, we did find that actually there is a period of time. Or where the peak curve progression still may occur after the peak height velocity of around eight to nine months. Now, based on all this data, uh, what, what do I do for my patients? So my approach is as this. When I see a patient with, let's say, 40 to 50 degree curve, generally, I would always check for the bone age first. All right? So depending on my bone age findings, if I find that the, the patient's at peak height velocity or within around nine months after that, I may probably discuss the options of, let's say, vertebral body tethering or even going for fusion, but I also give them the option if they want to try bracing, but providing the data that I've just shown you that it's unlikely to have a very good outcome. If they do choose brute bracing, I would have a close follow-up of every three months and really prognosticate with the supine flexibility um, to give them more counseling whether they really should go ahead for, uh, to continue brace treatment or not. Now, for those who are actually more than nine months after peak height velocity, I generally would encourage them to brace first, even if they present with 40, 50 degrees. Data have shown from all the studies I've, show, uh, I've produced here that uh, these patients may have a high chance of regression that is continuous post two years after brace weaning. 
So in these patients, I would generally try to be more aggressive with brace treatment, especially if they have lumbar curves, because uh, um, a large amount of these patients may actually avoid uh, surgery. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jason. Uh, so we open the floor to questions. If you are watching us online and if you have any questions, please type them out and uh, we will answer them here. So uh, perhaps I should start off first, uh, Jason. So um, if you have a 40 to 50 degree curve, even if they are beyond peak height velocity, some of them, you know, cosmetically, truncal balance wise, are not that pleasing. Um, if we treat them by bracing, um, what do you think of their final outcome in terms of their truncal balance and cosmetic concerns? Yeah, I think that's a great question because uh, although I, you know, what I gave you is kind of the general outlook of how I approach these patients, there's always uh, some additional comments or reasons where you may want to err on one side or the other. I can only tell you now that we don't have the data that supports whether, you know, someone has significant truncal shift who actually have regression or not, or those definitely go on progression. Uh, I can only tell we don't have the data right now, but of course, uh, given that, that kind of scenario, we'll always give that option to patients. Um, it's always a very controversial point at this stage, whether you know you should go for bracing and you, know, you wanna waste those few years and delay surgery or not. Um, so we'll, I, all I do is just give all the facts to the patients and uh, make a kind of a, a, you know, a decision together. It's always a difficult to, to point to one way or the other. We have another question from a delegate. Um, does flexibility of the curve predetermine the success of bracing? And do the bending films help us to determine if bracing is going to help? Yeah, so in general, um, that's exactly a couple all, like I presented four or five papers basically to support that, you know, so flexibility and uh, the age, bone age is the two main, main care, uh, key features to determine the proper prognostication. So patient is flexible, definitely there's a much higher chance for the brace to be successful, at least to control the curve. Uh, which, which is why, and if you look at my chart, um, when I see those patients who really don't want to do surgery right away, despite you know, having all those features we just discussed, if at the first meeting you see them, you know, the curve is really in, the in brace correction is not very good. You look at the flexibility is not very good. I mean, you, you probably just, you know, explain to the patients that the likelihood for this to be successful is quite low. And in those situ situations, you probably want to suggest them, um, you know, you may want to rethink, have a close follow-up and don't delay potential uh, non-fusion techniques if, you're, if, you're, if you have that available in your center. Okay. And in your experience, is there any different type of uh, brace that may work better one over another? Well, we're waiting for your study on that, but <laughs> um, we, we, I don't think there's a direct, um, you know, control trial or whatever that's going, well, you know, that, that's out there published uh, talking about one brace versus the other. Um, I think in general, you work with your, a good or orthotist who's experienced in one or the other. I mean, Data may show that you know the regression is great, much better. But if you have an orthotist who has no experience in that, then it's probably going to be worse than you know, doing their usual Boston bracing. There is a question from the uh, audience: uh, What is your protocol for bracing? In brief, uh, for example, patient selection: what kind of brace, how long, and when to be? Uh, that's that's a very uh, if that's a tough question, it's very comprehensive. <laughs> well, if, let's say just focus on these 40 to 50 degree curves, right? So um, as I mentioned, it depends whether they're, they're at the peak height velocity or not. So if they're in the peak height, then that's the kind of group you really want to monitor very closely. So generally get them in every three months, very close observation to see if there's any progression, you know, despite bracing. And in those cases, you probably offer surgery much earlier. Uh, in my center, uh, our offices are definitely much more experienced in Boston bracing. So we've always been uh, standardized Boston bracing in, in our center. Um, if they're much older, then I may not have that big, as big of a worry of for quite rapid deterioration. And we may want can space up the uh, space out the uh, follow up a little bit more than 
than those who are uh, premenarchal or uh, in peak head velocity. Uh, may may be one... Just, maybe just one quick question. I think we have Dr. Rajeshekhar and Dr. Prof. Hikit Wong as well, who have uh, huge work on bracing as well. Uh, can we also hear from them what is their protocol in terms of patient selection? What kind of brace do they uh, uh, recommend? And how long do they really recommend it? Is it till the completion of growth? And when do they start weaning off? Prof. Wong and Dr. Rajeshekhar, please. Um, actually, I, I, I wouldn't say that uh, um, we have that much experience in bracing in the sense that uh, we don't monitor them that closely. Um, I think that uh, it's not like within the study group. In fact, uh, we first follow the general rules of bracing. I did have a question about uh, the permanency of, of curve reduction uh, after bracing, after you have stopped bracing in these older children who has 40 to 50 degree curve and the test curve reduction, is the reduction permanent? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I can only tell you the data I have collected so far is two years, um, but definitely want to look into them in long term to see if that stays the same. Okay. Um, I think, uh, shall we move on to the next speaker uh, in view of time? Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you for all the questions. Uh, the next, uh, uh, Kenny will introduce the next speaker. Okay, yep. So uh, great discussion there. So what we'll do is we'll move on. Um, so we'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Xu Hua Yang from Taiwan, uh, who's going to talk about release and correction maneuvers in scoliosis surgery. Uh, Dr. Yang, please. Dear colleagues, I'm Su Yang from National Taiwan University. My topic today is release and correction maneuvers in scoliosis surgery. I have nothing to disclose. In order to prevent the potential of long-term adverse consequences, including unfavorable cosmesis and impaired pulmonary function, Spinal fusion is frequently performed for ARS patients with curves last larger than 50 degrees. Goals of ARS surgery include opti optimizing spinal balance, improving cosmesis, correcting deformity, preserving motion segments, preventing postoperative decompensation, and minimizing complications. The amount of scoliosis correction during surgery is related to flexibility and mobility of the spine, and the magnitude and direction of forces applied to the spine. In order to increase mobility of the spine, partial facet joint resection, various grades of spinal osteotomies, anterior release, and traction can be used. Complete removal of facet joints such as Smith-Peterson osteotomy, originally for correction of lumbar spine kyphosis, and Ponte osteotomy, originally for correction of Schumann's kyphosis, is also used in ARS correction. However, its clinical benefits for ARS correction remains debated. Three-column osteotomies, such as PSO and PVCR, are reserved for correction of severe rigid deformities with much greater surgical risks. Anterior release may be performed through sarcotomy or sarcoscopic approach. After the introduction of pedicle school instrumentation, anterior release is only for severe rigid curves or prominent thoracic lordosis. Various forms of Traction can be used in severe and rigid deformities. Traction may be used preoperatively, intraoperatively, between two stages of surgeries. Traction can gradually stretch the spine and its spinal structures over a period of weeks or months. A number of correction maneuvers are commonly used in scoliosis correction. Differential rock contouring was first described by Dr. Coltro and Duposet in 1988. This technique involves a relative over-contouring of thoracic kyphosis along the concave side to correct epical lordosis, 
restore thoracic kyphosis and posterior rotational movement in the axial plane. A relative under-contouring of thoracic kyphosis on the convex side to provide anterior directed movement along the apex in order to decrease rib harm. As in the classic CD technique, the rod is contoured in the ideal sagittal plane and loosely fixed to the anchors on the concave side of the curve. The rod is rotated 90 degrees in the axial plane and locked in place, thereby providing an apical translational correction. During the 90 degree rotation, the convex ribs must be controlled by pushing down to avoid aggravating rib prominence. Rod derotation maneuver can be performed by using single concave rod or dual rods. Vertebral translation pass on a reduction force to realign spinal segments toward a fixed rod. After proximal and distal anchors attach to a wheel contour rod, the other anchors are sequentially and gradually translate toward the rod. After initial capture of all anchors, the rod is rotated into proper sagittal alignment and lock in place proximally and distally before final apical translation. Sequential stepwise reduction over multiple vertebral segments is essential to minimize the risk of anchor pullout during reduction maneuver. Vertebral translation relies heavily on adequate fixation, so caution should be exercised in case of poor bone quality. After bending to desired contour for optimal sagittal alignment, the rod is fixed on one end of the construct, then manipulated and sequentially connected to each anchor to the opposite end. Cantilever techniques are particularly useful in hyperkyphotic deformity in AIS. Segmental compression and destruction allow fine adjustments in positioning of anchors along a rod. Segmental destruction is associated with increase in segmental kyphosis, especially beneficial in the concavity of thoracic curve with hypokyphosis. Segmental compression is associated with a low dosing effect. Compression and destruction are also useful to adjust tilt of LIV and UIV to prevent distal or proximal decompensation. In situ, rod contouring allows adjustments of rod shape after fixation to segmental instrumentations. This is typically useful in reversing rod diffraction occurring following rod derotation and translation. The rod shape can be adjusted in both chrono and sagittal plane simultaneously. In situ, rod bending may press significant stress on the bone imprint interface that may lead to catastrophic imprint failure. Pedicle schools provide three-column fixation, therefore can apply cor correction force for axial plane correction. The right vertebral derotation was first described by Dr. Lee and Suk in 2004. Correction forces in the axial plane may be applied regionally or segmentally. Embrock vertebral derotation involves applying a derotation force through multiple levels at the apical area. A posterior directed force is applied to the schools on the concavity, whereas a ventrally directed counterforce is applied on the curved convexity to facilitate vertebral rotation and decrease rib prominence. At the distal neutral vert levels, a rotational moment opposite to the curved derotation is applied to prevent global rotation. 
Segmental or direct vertebral derotation involves sequential rotation of each vertebral level. This technique provides axial control of each individual vertebra, but associated with an increased risk of structure failure of bone and bridge of critical schools. Triangulation between right and left anchors is cr critical to prevent this complication. Regardless of the derotation technique, axial correction forces should be applied in a slow, deliberate, and guarded manner. In this study, apical vertebral derotation was found in direct vertebral rotation method but not in single concave rod rotation method. Reham reduction was significant in both methods, but was better in direct vertebral rotation method. Regarding the differences between segmental and end block derotation, although each technique may have theoretical benefits and risks, no apparent differences in radiographic and clinical outcomes was observed between two techniques in this study. The concurrent use of both techniques was associated with increased blood loss, operated duration without any noticeable benefit. Temporary internal destruction applied destruction forces globally or regionally to facilitate correction of severe rigid scoliosis. It is typically combined with some combination of osteotomies or release. Temporary internal traction can alleviate the need of anterior release and hollow gravity traction. It can also be applied to reduction of a structure proximal thoracic curve in length key type 2 deformity. In summary, multiple factors may influence AIS correction. No single technique or approach is universally applicable or associated with clearly superior outcomes. Patient and surgeon specific decisions should be made regarding spinal mobilization, imprint construct, and correction techniques. Thank you so much for your attention. Yeah, thank you, uh, Prof. Yang. Um, maybe I will start with the first question. So, um, when you're doing the uh, vertebral derotation correction intraoperatively, how do you uh, determine that the derotation is adequate? Uh, do you uh, have clinical observation parameters? You observe it clinically intraoperatively, or do you use radiological? Uh, parameters to determine that the derotation is adequate. Um, it's a tough to answer. A tough question to to be answered. Uh, usually, uh, first of all, we have to make sure that your anchors are strong enough to uh, uh, withstand the uh, correction force, and uh, we we are not going to uh, overcorrect the vertebra because the um, any the rotation would be benefit uh, for the uh, harm correction. Not we, uh, the, the purpose of the um, uh, correction is to is going to reduce the harm if, if not on, on the rotational point of view. So uh, usually, um, I, I, I'm not get, going to give a very accurate, correct, uh, very, very exact answer for your question, but um, I just feel that um, that's the extent of correction I dare to do. I, I, I'm not, uh, because um, once the uh, school is pulled out, you, you have no, 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 nothing better to, to, to do on the Apex. So uh, usually you just have to do it very carefully and do whatever you think is safe, instead of uh, how much correction you can get during the, the rotation.
how about the raw materials, Professor Yang? Um, is there any specific uh, preference for you for each technique? Unfortunately, um, in Taiwan, we only have one material can be, cho can be, can be chosen. So I, I cannot tell you my personal uh, experiences. We only have titanium alloy can, can be chosen. But um, I, my, my feeling on the soft uh, titanium alloy is that uh, sometimes we, we are not going to do too much or uh, excessive uh, correction using of flexible rods. But I, I, uh, so I, I pretty much uh, 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 are happy with the, the result I have now because the balance is good. Um, but I don't re really have uh, the, the experience on very uh, uh, rigid rod like cobochrome, so I cannot compare two materials. Sure, okay. And uh, for Soako Prosti, it's not because uh, it's for the, the other um, uh, cosmesis of, uh, point of view, but um, it's not uh, really related to the uh, release or correction uh, uh, aspect. But uh, uh, although mo uh, some papers insist Soako Prosti doesn't uh, affect the pulmonary function at all, but um, if the patient can accept uh, some minor residual uh, drip deformity, then uh, so-called prosty, I still uh, worry about the potentially have some uh, compromising the uh, pulmonary function. So I, in, in my opinion, there's no, not any cosmesis um, factor, it's uh, worthwhile to be, you know, uh, 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 to uh, the function, to use the function to, to uh, the, as a uh, trade-off uh, factor. I do agree with that uh, comment. Yeah, so I think in view of time, thank you so much, Professor Yang, for your uh, good, uh, great lecture. So in view of time, I think we have to proceed with the next speaker who will be presenting a case. So I will... I'm Tomo Hirobano from Hamamatsu University School of Medicine. I will present here a case with AIS. This is a 15 year old girl complaining of scoliosis. She was pointed out her scoliosis at the age of 11 by her parents, but she did not receive any treatment. She was referred to nearby orthopedic clinic at the age of 13 and diagnosed as AIS. She started breast treatment, but the sclerosis progressed, so she referred to our department at the age of 15. She had a past history of bronchial asthma, well controlled, no family history. At the first visit, she had a red lumbar hump, no regular discrepancy, no neurological deficit, no joint laxity, no cafe spot, and no zacular skin lesion. She had a major frog lumbar lumbar curve of 43 degree at the age of 13 uh, before breast treatment. Her scoliosis progressed regardless of breast treatment. Main thoracic curve was from T4 to T11, 39 degrees, and thoracic lumbar lumbar curve was from T11 to L4, uh, 47 degrees, respectively. L4 tube was 21 degrees and RISA sign was 3. In traction radio, her main thoracic curve decreased to 19 degrees and the thoracic lumbar lumbar curve decreased to 23 degrees. Inside the bending radiograph, her main thoracic curve decreased to 20 degrees and the thoracic lumbar lumbar curve decreased to 17 degrees. L34 disc was flexible. I would like to discuss about three points. This is a rank type 5 C curve. When is the best timing for surgical treatment? How about the surgical procedure, anterior or posterior? How about the fusion level, selective or non-selective? UIV and LIV. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the case, Dr. Bangkok. 
Um, maybe I will start the discussion by asking the first three speakers uh, to give comments on uh, this. Uh, can we, can we, we bring up Dr. the X-ray again? Can we keep the X-ray on? <laughs> yeah, Kaylin, can you keep the slides on, please? Uh, okay, yeah, can you put back the slides on? I think, I think just uh, by looking at it, uh, you know, the patient has had bracing done and has progression despite bracing, so it is an indication of ready for surgery at this stage. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't delay any further because the brace is obviously not effective. Um, uh, if you delay it any further, you might have to extend the fusion levels. Um, so that's not something we want. Okay, can we keep the last slide on? I, I think just based on that, I think the, what I would suggest is a posterior fusion of both curves because the uh, thoracic curve, um, despite you know only 30 something degrees, uh, it is quite structural uh, with a lot of rotation component and uh, the flexibility is not not so good. It only goes on 20 degrees or something. So I would definitely uh, go take that uh, thoracic curve in addition to the lumbar curve. Uh, the L UIV, I think it was a T4, I said, uh, and then down to L4. Uh, L3 is quite far from the uh, CSVL. I'm a little bit worried, uh, despite you noting that you noted that L3-4 is quite flexible with this. Um, it's still quite far off. And patient who is, uh, you know, still growing and uh, has a significant lumbar component. If, if we go take the to take it down to L4, it'll probably be much safer. Uh, so Jason, I think Lau just mentioned, we, we had a beautiful description about the various classification systems. And if we go by the current Lenke's classification, uh, this curve, the upper thoracic, main thoracic one seems to be bending down to 21, means it's 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 a non-structural curve. And if the guidelines have to be believed upon, uh, which are very vague, hazy, and in gray zone, this is something like a thoracolumbar curve only, and the main thoracic can be spared. However, your 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 uh, feeling is that the main thoracic also needs to go under fusion. So well, I, are I you trying to say that guidelines are uh, guidelines based on the classification are not absolute and Many a time, there are other things also to be taken into consideration while choosing the... I'm Tomo Hirobano from Hamamatsu University School of Medicine. I will present here a case with AIS. Um, Kaleen, you may have to ex just expedite it. Uh, you, have to, you have to forward it to the slides, then pause it. Is it possible? Yeah, I'm not saying that uh, selective is nothing, no, no, you know, not an option, but um, you need to be very careful not to overcorrect. Uh, in these cases where you, if, you know, it's not a very severe curve, but if you overcorrect, completely strain the uh, sort of lumbar segment, uh, I would be worried about the uh, response for the thoracic curve. May, may I also have a word from all the other faculty members here? The, um... Whether, whether there is a chance of doing a selective fusion kind of fusing only the thoracolumbar curve and wait for spontaneous correction of the thoracic curve to happen, as has been uh, shown in literature that spontaneous correction does happen, or, or it's safe to play and go T4 to L4. Maybe I start off first, you know, I, I did a classification early on. So, so looking at this curve, right, you know, we go on the classification you're all familiar with, which is a lengthy classification. So I agree that uh, T4 to T11 is 39 degrees, which is the main thoracic curve, right? This is, uh, we have to determine the structurality of this. We look at the bender. And then for the uh, the, length, the lumbar curve itself, the apex is between the uh, L1 and L2. So for, for sure, I think this is a lumbar curve, 47 degrees that uh, bends down uh, to whatever number it is, this is considered major curve. So question is this, is it a 5C curve or is it a 6C curve, right? So the confusion between 5C and uh, uh, 6C is uh, it's not easily um, uh, determined. So I think uh, the speaker has got the traction film and also a bender. Can we look at the, uh, so bender is down to 20 and there's also a traction film, right? So by Lenke, this is a 5C, right? Because it's bend, the mean thoracic curve bends down to 20 degrees, right? Isn't it? So this is a 5C curve. Then, of course, Lenke also mentioned that we should look at the whether it's a hypokyphotic thoracic curve or hyperkyphotic or normal kyphotic, right? So that 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 is uh, uh, your consideration as well. Again, I mentioned that sagittal alignment uh, um, structurality is important. So we have to look at T10 to L2 to see whether there's any kyphotic elements to it or not. 
So if they are all negative, it's a pure 5C N curve uh, in the, this situation, uh, my approach will be uh, to consider uh, from uh, just the lumbar curve itself. Uh, and of course, if you follow uh, Guan's uh, classification, they may extend down to the main thoracic as well. So question then, of course, should you do, do front or back? Uh, in my hands, uh, and if I can save level, I generally try to save level. That means that in this case, uh, if I were to do anterior um, uh, approach, right, and if I can go up down to L3, I would out to L3. So in this case, uh, I think that uh, T10 to L3 anterior approach is an option uh, for me. So, Lim, you're saying you're going to do T10 to L3 ASF for this case. Is that right? Uh, L3... T10 to L3 ASF. L3, maybe L4. Well, I can't see the L4 so well, so there are some rotation elements, but the N itself is, is definitely at the... the um, the, the apex is L2 vertebrae. The apex of it, it's L2 and maximally rotated is with apex is L2. L3 okay, also so, so the for four in this situation is the, the most, tilt, most tilted L4. So I, I often also look at the uh, bending and see whether the uh, rotation and self-corrected itself or not. Right. If you get a correction at L4 in a bender, uh, again, uh, you, you may consider to go to L3. Okay, um, I'll let you think about it. I'll come back to you. Kaylin, can you go <laughs> back to the last slide? Uh, Professor Yang, what is your, your, your decision? I'm going to ask everyone because yeah, yeah, people are not sure about you. Oh, sorry. This is a, a perfect case for discussion and debating because there are several uh, conditions of borderline. Borderline for uh, fusion for double curve or borderline for choosing uh, fusion labels. But uh, I, I, I noticed that uh, even not so much that's uh, pelvic tilt in this patient. The right side is uh, higher than the left side. For the patients with uh, lumbar curve, especially major lumbar curve, such kind, such pelvic tilt, uh, pelvic, uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, asymmetry, if you level up the pelvis, sometimes you will reduce some extent of the lumbar curve. You will, in this borderline uh, amount of scoliosis, sometimes you will change your decision completely if you, you just, you know, have a shoe lift, a little bit shoe lift on the uh, shoulder side. So that's uh, one of the points I would like to uh, point out. The second point is the, um, because the thoracic curve, uh, I'm not very clearly uh, noted uh, if the rotation of thoracic spine rotation is uh, large or not. If the thoracic vertebral rotation is large, and, and I, 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 I will completely agree with a few sports curves, but if the thoracic curve, the thoracic vertebral is not that much rotation, we can, part, we can just consider fuse, the lumbar curve, selective lumbar curve, uh, selective lumbar fusion only either from interior or posterior, depends on what's your uh, you com what's your com comfortable uh, technique? If you do from the front, from the back, it's maybe selective lumbar fusion from T uh, T eleven to L four maybe, and uh, for the an anterior fusion, maybe it can can be done from T twelve to L three. Of course, any selective fusion, it's a risk of uh, progression in the non fuse area. So we have to discuss with the the patient and, the, and, and, the, and their parents uh, carefully about uh, treating the patient in selective fusion. Some parents or some patients, uh, uh, you know, they had to have a secondary surgery. In such case, maybe we should consider a few post curves, depends on, on, on the discussion. But if the, um, they, they can uh, understand the, 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 the benefit of selective fusion, but there's a risk of progression in the secondary surgery, even though the, the, the chance is not, not big. Then I would prefer to do a selective lumbar fusion for this, this patient, either from anterior or posterior. Prof Wong, may I know your uh, suggestions for this case? Yeah, I think this is a very good illustrative case. Um, if you go back to the um, 
AP standing AP X-ray. Um, I believe that the thoracic curve is probably larger than 39 degrees because the um, upper end vertebra is probably higher than the one indi indicated. So one of the, some of the guidelines for selective fusion would be the ratio of um, lumbar curve um, over the thoracic curve, as well as the lumbar hum over the thoracic hum, and the magic number is 1.2 for lumbar. So I did uh, some calculation and I found that uh, if I accept 39 degrees as the correct measurement here and 47 is correct measurement. Also, so now the, this, so some of you may agree that T4, the, the, upper, the upper end vertebra line, the upper end tilt is probably more than what is there. All right, if you look very carefully, it's probably at T2 or T3, it's probably about just over 40 degrees. But even assuming that 39 is correct, the ratio is 1.205, which is really at the margin. So if you, if, if the thoracic curve is around 40, it's just over 40, I'm always very careful whether I would do selective in these patients because the, it will end up with the patient having quite a significant thoracic curve at the end. Um, uh, so I, I think that um, the ratio here is not, um, um, really supportive of selective fusion, but I do not know what the thoracic hum and lumbar hums are. So we divide using the same thing. If we have a lumbar hum measurement, then we divide it by the thoracic hum measurement. It should be more than 1.2. And um, so, so um, uh, that, that those features are important. Over here, I, I, I'm more inclined to, to fuse both curves. Whenever I see a thoracic curve of more than 40 degrees, although it bends very nicely, I'm more inclined to do both curves. Now, if, if I should do uh, selective, then I would undercorrect. I would certainly undercorrect the lumbar curve. Mm -hmm. As far as anterior or posterior, I love doing anterior. But whenever the end vertebra is L4, I don't like to, to sort of, um, um, uh, I don't like the psoas at L4, it's very large and very big. So whenever I want to end at L4, I will again choose the posterior in this case. Um, yeah. One quick question Prof. before we proceed. Uh, are there any guidelines based on kings as well? I mean. Uh, we have all been talking about Linkage classification guidelines with this. This is like a typical King's type one curve. Um, are we are we not looking at those guidelines given by King's for type one curves? Hmm. Or King's is abs obsolete now totally. Yeah, link that uh, uh, King's uh, classification is really suitable for like Harrington rods, right? And also uh, at best uh, the Dukey wire. And once it, it comes to the, uh, uh, like even the CD system, they are quite underserved. So I, I don't think, uh, you know, uh, the king is too useful in this situation. I think uh, Lanky is probably uh, most people is familiar with. Okay. All right. So maybe uh, I would ask uh, Dr. Bano, what are your concerns uh, in this patient uh, when you select this case uh, and when you ask these questions? Thank you. Uh... We, uh, this is a case with 25.5C, but uh, uh, I think that it is relatively rigid uh, thrust curve. So uh, we, we discussed about uh, selective or non-selective, which is better. All right. So uh, maybe uh, in view of time, can you show us uh, what you have done? Yeah, yeah. And then maybe we give some comments uh, on it. Posterior cork to fusion in this case. Selective thoracic lumbar lumbar fusion. After operation, thoracic lumbar lumbar curve was corrected to 10 degrees. However, main thoracic curve remained. Shoulder imbalance and the coronal imbalance occurred. I present here the time cost change of radiograph. After operation, main thoracic curve was progressed and disc wedging and the LRV progress for the compensation of coronal balance. 
right shoulder elevation also remained. Now, we think this case should be performed non-selective fusion to prevent the progression of thoracic curve. Yeah, so we have the um, um, surgeon did the selective lumbar fusion, and uh, this is the result of uh, the surgery. Uh, any comments from the faculty? Yeah, I, I just want to mention one thing because you know this this is why I was saying about the selective fusion. If you do a, such a good correction, it completely you know squared and parallel, then you have this concern because we worry the thoracic is still structural. So. So what I mentioned is if if you if you want to get away with selective, you need to keep that residual tilt, you know, to compensate for those graphic curves. If too good of a correction will will have this risk. Mm. Yes. 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 Although this case was done by selective fusion, but I think the, the fusion level selection is a little bit, you know, maybe not ideal for this selective fusion. Uh, just as I mentioned, if uh, I do selective fusion for this patient from posterior, I'll select T11 to L4 instead of this T10 to L3. Because the label you, you fuse will, will you know, uh, affect the, the later behavior of the unfused un, un, label. So I, I, of course I cannot say if the fusion label selection is bad, it's uh, not the same. Uh, in this case, we'll, we'll, we'll change the, the fate of the proximal unfused labels, but I, don't, I, I, I still have a doubt if this selective fusion do, done in the correct or uh, optimal level of fusion. If we do selective fusion for this patient from posterior, I, I, I will suggest to do from T11 to L4 instead of T10 for to L3. I, I would like to make one, one comment. Um, sure, if you're doing selective fusion, I feel that the anterior fusion gives a better way to, to dial in the under correction. I find it very hard to do under correction in the posterior fusion. I don't know whether it's just, our, just the way we do things, you know, but um, it is very hard to do under correction. Uh, in to to uh, to to underbend the rod in three dimensions. Um, um, if I do selective fusion, I will be very very carefully adjust the tilt of the UIV and LIV to make sure the LIV and LIV have a reasonable tilt, but not correct not the, the the curve corrected perfectly. So leave more tilt at the uh, end, very broad fused. It's safer for uh, selective fusion, it, no, no matter in the thoracic or in the lumbar selective fusion. I, I actually think, you know, the, the, the problem at the end is still gonna be what Prof Wong suggested at the beginning. It is the lumbar curve is always much more flexible and much easier to correct. So it's very hard to under correct you have started off with a very significant thoracic curve. And even though it's flexible, just because it's flexible, it may not actually unbend to what you want it to be, uh, what the benders show. So eventually when you have almost a straight spine in the lumbar curve, the thoracic spine is very, very, you're asking the thoracic spine to do a lot to balance out to what you've done surgically to the lumbar spine. And even if you do, uh, the thoracic spine unbends at its best, it's still only at 17 degrees or whatever the bend is short. It's still very difficult to balance a completely straight curve. That's, that's kind of my worry. Yes, uh, any more comments from the faculty? Yeah, I think there's a question from the chat group uh, or the, from the audience. Um, asking maybe regarding uh, whether he's 15 years old uh, at the age, whether it is, is it a factor in uh, choosing selective or non-selective fusion? Yeah. Um, maybe I can ask Dr. Banu, would you consider um, selective thoracic fusion if this patient is much younger? Uh, 
I don't think the age did not affect the fusion level in this case. Well, my mentor uh, said to me, uh, you know, if the surgeon is young or the patient is young, then you should go long. You should not go for selective. <laughs> so, so I think this is a very uh, important to bear in mind, you know, in the selection. Uh, and in this case, of course, uh, so the patient is not that young, it's about 15 years old. I like yeah, the comment about the young surgeon. Very important. <laughs> you, short, you, have a, you have to have a long discussion. If you want to have a short discussion, you have to feel so, feel longer. <laughs> um, maybe I can ask a last question uh, uh, regarding uh, undercorrecting, uh, as highlighted by Professor Wong Kiki. Um, if you were to undercorrect the lumbar, what strategy would you use, uh, as mentioned earlier? Well, I, I certainly find that uh, anterior, I will go anterior because uh, anterior allows me to bend the rod quite a lot to accommodate the curve. Uh, if it's posterior, um, it can be very difficult in three dimensions. I will, first, um, I will first get the sagittal plane. And after the sagittal plane, I will add on the coronal plane. And um, it's very hard to manipulate a very short rod posteriorly. And uh, that's all I can say, but it doesn't work out well all the time. <laughs> yeah, it always ends up, wow, it's very straight, you know? Yeah, so <laughs> that, 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 that's why I, I, I prefer anterior if I do that. And I would like, I would end at L3 if I'm undercorrecting because that will allow me more, more vertebrae to curve below. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bano, for the very interesting case presentation. Uh, we'll push, I think uh, I'll let my co-moderator -mod to introduce the next speaker. Okay, so that was a very, very interesting discussion on a very nice case. Um, so we'll move on. Uh, we'd like to uh, invite and introduce Professor Ike Wong from Singapore, um, who is going to talk about anterior growth modulation and non-fusion surgery for idiopathic scoliosis. Uh, Prof Wong, please. Good afternoon, everyone. You have heard many useful tips from the previous speakers on how to perform posterior scoliosis surgery. In this presentation, I would like to introduce you to an alternative to spinal fusion for the treatment of idiopathic scoliosis. Since the 1920s, spinal fusion has been the mainstay of surgical treatment for progressive curves. Early fusion in the skeletally immature patient is frowned upon as it might result in a short trunk length. This 11-year-old girl was skeletally immature when she first presented. You can see the brace had hardly any effect on the curve. We waited until she is skeletally mature or when the curve increases past 50 degrees by which time the lumbar curve has also progressed significantly. I am sure some of you may even decide to fuse both curves instead of the selective fusion that was done. The question here is, are there other options if a similar case comes up tomorrow? Can we do better in the 21st century? Yes, over the past 10 years, we have a new option anterior vertebral tethering that gives definitive control of curve progression instead of relying on bracing. We can also use it to harness spinal growth to correct the deformity and all these without the need for spinal fusion, thereby preserving spinal motion. In this early report shown on the right, the authors performed anterior vertebral tethering in an eight-year-old boy. Differential growth between the concave and convex sides fully corrected the curve after four years. A prerequisite for performing this type of surgery is sufficient growth potential. Rigid and flexible tethers in immature animals with straight spines have been shown to cause scoliosis. 
the growth modulation is quite powerful. It can even bend a solid metal rod. Here we have an 11-year-old skeletally immature patient. She is a menarche. Her risk grade is zero, Sanders three, with hip triradiate cartilage still open. She was put in a brace, but five months later, the curve has progressed. What would you do? Fuse the spine now? Probably not. If you follow the conventional treatment protocol, you will probably persist with the brace and fuse her later when she is skeletally mature, at which time the curve will also be much larger. However, we now have a new option, which is anterior vertebral tethering. Anterior vertebral tethering involves the placement of screws into the vertebral bodies on the convex side, typically from cob to cob, and the insertion of a flexible but non-elastic polyethylene tether. The procedure is performed through a minimal access thoracoscopic approach with deflation of the right lung. Typically, four porters are used. These intraoperative radiographs show the implanted screws. The radiolucent tether cannot be seen. This patient is undergoing anterior vertebral tethering from T6 to T12. I stand behind the patient. The most caudal rib head is identified as T12. As you can see here, the segmental vessels are taken down at mid-body level using a harmonic scalpel. The screw entry point is perforated and tapped through to the far cortex using a DSG cannulated tap, which has audio feedback depending on the vascularity of the bone. Alternatively, one can use a regular bone tap and use the change in torque and C-arm image to guide insertion. Next, a bone staple is inserted following which a screw of the appropriate length is inserted. Bicortical purchase is preferred. As you can see in this picture. A polyethylene tether is inserted and fastened from the cranial to caudal direction. Note the use of a tensioning device to tension the tether to achieve immediate correction of the curve. Tensioning is particularly important in more mature patients. To achieve immediate curve correction on the table, as, they may, as there may be insufficient spinal growth left to effect correction by differential growth. If you watch carefully at those areas of the tether, you can see the tensioning taking place. The patient's post-operative progress is shown. There is immediate curve correction due to tether tensioning. Progressive correction of the thoracic curve is seen over the next 18 months due to differential spinal growth. Although the result is good in this patient, vertebral body tethering can be associated with its unique set of complications. We learned how to reduce these complications over the past 10 years from our own as well as others' experiences. In 2011, we had the opportunity to conduct a phase 2A first in human trial of a new tether implant. 
which was approved for use in five patients. All were skeletally immature, with cop angles ranging from 35 to 47 degrees. This slide shows the changes in the cop angle of the tethered segments over the course of four years. Two time-dependent patterns are seen. One, where there was no change in the cop angle, and the other, where there was a significant reduction in the cop angle to zero degrees and beyond. The underlying factor for these two patterns was growth potential. The two patients with significant curve correction were more immature and had open triradiate cartilage at the time of surgery. This slide shows the time course of a patient who had close triradiate cartilage at the time of surgery. Note there was insufficient growth potential to achieve curve correction, but the procedure prevented curve progression. The tether was placed without tensioning in this series of patients. This next patient was immature with open triradiate cartilage at the time of surgery. There was progressive correction of the thoracic curve ending in slight overcorrection. Two patients needed additional surgery. Patient three was the youngest patient in the group. She was nine years old and her triradiate cartilage was open at the time of surgery. She had overcorrection of her curve, spinal decompensation, and distal adding on. She subsequently underwent removal of the tether and posterior spinal fusion. The other patient who had surgery had curve stabilization initially, but had curve progression after two years. She underwent posterior spinal fusion at 60 months post-operative. In his series, Dr. Newton reported a mean curve correction of 51%, with 10 out of 17 patients achieving a cop angle of less than 35 degrees. 41% of patients underwent revision surgeries, and 47% were suspected to have broken tethers. This recent report from Dr. Alune showed that immature patients experienced more overcorrection, while less immature patients displayed a lower risk of mechanical complications. In summary, anterior vertebral tethering is a non-fusion, growth-friendly, motion-preserving procedure. It has been shown to achieve curve correction in skeletally immature patients. In less immature patients, it functions as an internal brace to control curve progression. The indications for vertebral tethering are skeletally immature patients with high risks of curve progression. A cop angle of not more than 50 degrees which bends to less than 30 degrees. Lanky 1, right thoracic curves, and possibly Lanky 5 curve types are suitable cases. To some, lumbar tethering may provide more benefits in motion preservation than thoracic tethering. But there are challenges in using this procedure. Predicting the amount of remaining growth and the correction that can be achieved remains a challenge. Overcorrection has been observed in the very young patients, while insufficient correction has been observed in the more mature patients. Tether breakage and loss of correction are other concerns. So, patients who undergo this procedure need to be prepared for additional surgeries after the index procedure. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Prof. Wong. Um, maybe I would I can start with the first question. Yeah, so um, is there a situation whereby you can revise the tether rather than uh, revise it to a posterior spinal fusion? Uh, if there is overcorrection? 
Yes, yes, there, there certainly is. Um, uh, so if the patient has achieved full um, maturity by the time you, know, you want to do surgery, then um, naturally um, uh, conventional spinal fusion you know, to, to be the final procedure would be preferred, all right? Uh, but it is possible to, to, to revise it, to actually go in through the chest again, uh, expose the implant system. Um, you can um, uh, either release the tether, cut the tether, you know, replace the tether. I mean, that all can be done. Uh, if the over if the overcorrection is basically at the ends is even easier in the sense that uh, you only expose the ends and to release the tether, yeah, yeah. So so there are there are always options. But if we do that, then uh, there could be a risk of future tether breakage and uh, or another revision. So if the patient has reached skeletal maturity. I would always discuss uh, with the with the, uh, the 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 patient, of course, parents, as to whether we just do the final definitive procedure. It could be an anterior procedure. It need not be posterior. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um. Yeah, can I have a question for Prof Wong? Okay. Sure. Sure. Go ahead. Yeah, Prof Wong. Okay. Great talk. Uh, uh, learned a lot as well. Um. Just wanted to understand a little bit more about your, uh, your decision making for all these cases because I see your uh, indication was less than 50 degrees. That, that limits the range quite significantly. And uh, you know what, what exactly is the, you know, the lower range or the upper range of kind of call angles and does flexibility take into account uh, when you decide to do a VBT or not? Yeah, so I think that um... We, we always we are still learning. We are still learning as to you know what is the best sort of uh, curve size to do this, and uh, for the upper range, uh, fifty is of course a, a more arbitrary figure. Is more like uh, what would be uh, the correction that you can get, the flexibility you have. Tether breakage is probably one of the more common things, uh, 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 complications rather that, that they come about. And there seem to be data that to suggest that if at the end of the procedure, when your first upright X-ray is more than 30 degrees, there is a greater or higher risk of tether breakage. I think it's related to perhaps the mechanical lever arm, you know, that, that's, that, that, that's uh, there. So it is important that, that uh, one should have uh, a fairly good correction at the end of the procedure, particularly in the more mature patients. Um, so flexibility is probably the more uh, important indicator than the actual uh, uh, number, cop angle. The lower end is, of course, uh, uh, harder to discuss because uh, if you bring it lower, then uh, one can be accused of uh, over-treatment. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that, that's it, yeah. I hope it answers yeah. your question. Yeah, maybe one more quick question. I think um, from the floor, they ask, bracing is conventionally recommended for group under 40 degree curve. Um, uh, are there any obvious advantages uh, as spinal fusion procedure is required at a later date? So maybe I, if I understand this question correctly, what maybe I can rephrase that. Uh, what what is the curve degree or what are the parameters that you uh, would decide to offer tethering? Well, oh, actually, it's very much like the brace because many of the patients come because they just cannot either cannot tolerate the brace or uh, on follow-up on the brace, it's increasing. But uh, perhaps I can answer this uh, question in a more direct sense that uh, fusion is not necessarily a required procedure at the end because if, if the curve remains like so and there's no breakage or increase in the angle, uh, it is not necessary to always, it's not always necessary to undergo fusion. Right, thank you very much, Prof Wong. Um, we will proceed with the next speaker. Thank you. Okay, all right.
So uh, the next speaker will be my actually my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Kenny, who will be presenting on neuromonitoring in scoliosis surgery. Um, can you all hear the audio? I think there's no audio. Intraoperative neuromonitoring is a gold standard in all spinal deformity surgeries. It alerts the surgeon of an impending neural injury that may lead to a permanent neurologic deficit, and so the surgeon is able to reverse the previous steps to try to salvage the neurological damage that might have occurred to the patient. When we're talking about monitoring modalities, we are often talking about different modalities such as SSEP. MEP and EMG. So often we're now doing a multimodal neuromonitoring, meaning that more than one modality is used, which increases the sensitivity of detecting a neurological complication. So for this study, you can see that when we're doing different modalities, the sensitivity of detecting a neurological damage is much increased than using one modality alone. So for motor evoked potential, it is a reflection of the function of the motor pathways in the cord, an interop measure of the spinal cord perfusional ischemia through the anterior spinal artery. The key monitoring modality is with the pedicle screw, traction, and for kyphosis correction. For SSEP, it monitors the sensory tracts and detects injury to the sensory and ascending pathways in the cord and is useful when we're doing laminectomies, intradural resections, tumor resections, sublaminal wire insertions, and hook implant insertions. So when there is an MEP decrease, it signifies that there is either a direct trauma, ischemia, or some other interoperative event that has happened that can affect the motor pathways. For direct trauma, Often the drop is unilateral, may be associated with a drop of SSE. DP and often follows a particular event or a step that can be salvaged. For ischemia, often it affects the MEP alone, it is usually bilateral, and it is more common after insertion of the rod, where there is prolonged traction, where the blood pressure is low, or the hemoglobin is low. So how do we use intraoperative monitoring to minimize neurologic injury for scoliosis? So there are a few principles that I'm going to outline in this talk that can help us and I've divided them into preoperative, intraoperative, postoperative, and a contingency plan. And I'm going to go through this one by one. Preoperatively, first thing we can think about is neural protection. This is a little bit controversial and not a huge amount of evidence, but Rilizzo, which has been borrowed from the use of acute spinal cord injury, it is a agent that can change the excessive influx of sodium and calcium that triggers extracellular release of glutamate in the presynaptic neurons and in the postsynaptic neuron the sodium and the calcium influx can lead to cellular death and axonal edema so the neuroprotective effect 
of the vertical appears to block these sodium channels and prevent an exaggerated calcium influx. In addition, it may play a role as an anti-glutamate agent via the inhibition of glutamate. This idea is really borrowed from the acute spinal cord injury, where rilisol usage has been shown to have some neurological improvement compared to those patients who didn't receive rilisol. Of course, we don't have precise evidence to support this, but this is something that you may consider. Secondly, preoperative planning. If you're going to do a significant curve with scoliosis, for example, in this child with a cob of 150 degrees who already has some bilateral lower limb neurologic deficit, you want to plan adequately. How do we do that? Well, you may want to get some traction films and some proper radiographs and bending radiographs to look and plan your surgical strategy. You may want to get a CT scan to know preoperatively which pedicles are actually blinded and you cannot insert screws. How are you going to reduce the spine or what type of osteotomy you're going to use? useful to get all the imaging to see the status of the cord before you attempt the operation. You may want to minimize time to calculate exactly which level you're going to use what instrument and how best to improve your chances of damaging the cord or the nerve root by using whatever means is available to you whether shown in this example using a 3D model and 3D jig or a navigated procedure, whatever is available to you to try to minimize damage to the cord. So in this case, we use a jig, which help us to decrease the surgical time and improve the accuracy of putting in instrumentations. So secondly, interoperative time-up. This is especially important. It should be led by the consultant in charge of the surgery so that the whole surgical team is aware of the surgical procedure, the plans, and any contingency plans. The anesthetic team is involved, particularly in terms of the use of anesthetic agents. When are they going to use the muscle relaxants? What are the requirements of the mean arterial pressure during each critical step that you're going to do? What type of blood and fluid conservative management you're going to use? Interoperative neuroprotection if required. And a wake-up test because the anesthetist is key to this part of the procedure. The neurophysiologist who's going to help you to do the neuromonitoring. Important to communicate with them before the surgery what is your definition of an alert? The nurses and the rest of the scrub team should know what they are doing. So the surgical strategy is also important. If you're going to do a very long surgery, is it better to stage the surgery so that everyone is fresh when they're doing the critical part of the surgery, such as osteotomy, on the next day rather than late in the evening? Blood and fluid management is important. So what type of blood conservation methods you're going to use? For example, are you going to use a cell saver? Is transuric acid going to be given even before bleeding occurs? And what are your fluid and mean arterial blood pressure requirements during dissection, during the VCR, and during your correction? So these are all communicated with the anesthetist and can help to deal with problems later on. So how to deal with a signal loss when you have one with neuromonitoring in scoliosis surgery? For example, this is a very typical curve of a thoracic scoliosis and you plan for a selective thoracic fusion, which seems normal, but even a normal scoliosis surgery can result in a signal loss. So when you get a signal loss, how do you interpret these findings? 
It is a unilateral or bilateral finding, both MEP and SSEP, or just one modality, and how much of a drop is significant to you and the neurophysiologist. You need to decide that with international guidelines and your own experience. Have a flowchart. We have a flowchart at the University of Hong Kong so that when a signal drop occurs, this is automatically activated and it has a checklist of things that the electrophysiologist should do. So they should check with the leads to rule out any potential false positive. They should check, for example, any additional groups, quantify and communicate this to the surgical team, assess the patterns that may be associated with different type of injuries, and re-evaluate with neuromonitoring. The spine surgeon needs to stop whatever they're doing, inform any supervising spine surgeon if they are not the lead, and assess what steps they could reverse in the whole surgery that may be related to the scoliosis surgery. And the anaesthetist also has a whole list of things that they need to do, including checking the degree of blockade, checking the blood pressure, oxygen, the hemoglobin, etc., etc. The point is, I don't want you to learn all of these. This should be in a checklist, and it ensures a systematic approach whenever a neural monitoring problem occurs. For example, if you're doing a more complicated surgery, such as a semi-segmented heavy vertebra excision, where after you're putting a screw, you've suddenly noticed a drop, do a trigger EMG, and you find out that there is a problem with the screw. So this helps you to immediately identify the step that is causing a neurological problem, and you can reverse that easily. So a screw malposition is, has an intrinsic relationship when you're doing a trigger EMG, and you can change that easily. Interoperatively, if you need to do a wake-up test, well, you need to have primed the patient, obtained consent prior to the surgery. It is also operator dependent, so you need to have the whole team working for you to know that who is going to do that wake-up test. And you assess grossly the motor power of that patient. If interoperatively you do have an event, are you going to give steroid? When and when? After the operation, always remember to check the patient before transferring them if they're going to be remain to be intubated. You need to do a wake-up test before transferring. Post-operative requirements, if you've had a neuromonitoring event, you better keep the spinal cord in good perfusion for the next 24 hours, and you need to communicate that with your post-operative doctors. A contingency plan is required. Stage the surgery, abandon the surgery, accept less correction and fusion in situ. So thank you for listening to me and thank you Kenny um, for the uh, informative uh, talk. I will start with the first question. Um, is there any situation whereby uh, you are unable to get a preoperative MEP? And what would you do? Uh, would you because uh, usually a preoperative MEP is done after the patient is under general anesthesia. So what would you do? Would you uh, uh, stop uh, the surgery and uh, do, and uh, investigate, or would you proceed with the surgery? Yeah, so it's very unusual to have an idiopathic scoliosis and not be able to get an MEP at all. So if you're certain about your diagnosis, then you better speak to the electrophysiologist to see if they have put their electrodes correctly and your anesthetic team has not put their neuromuscular blockade before you're getting a supine or prone MEP. Because most often, uh, our practice is that we don't obtain the baseline until we turn the patient prone in the straightforward AIS surgery. So I think that also brings up an important question as to 
how you communicate with the team and what sort of baseline and when you're going to do it. So if you have a case that already has some sort of neurological deficit in the neuromuscular case, you may want to do an awake intubation or without neuromuscular blockade and a supine baseline first prior to turning prone. While normal AIS case, we don't. So uh, if really you cannot get a baseline in the AIS case, that would be very, um, very worrying uh, because that is, should not normally happen. All right, thank you. Can you very good talk? Uh, can I ask you, uh, do you monitor the S3 to S4 or S2 for that matter uh, in your cases? Particularly, you know, you show an F case, right, isn't it? You mean so sometimes behavior? you may not get uh, adequate uh, monitoring. At, you, you go down to S1 only, right, isn't it, on your uh, EHR or the uh, helix adduct adductors. So do you mean for the AIS cases or for other cases? In general. In general, yes, we do, yes, yeah. Uh, we don't monitor S2, S3, no. We only monitor uh, the, 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 the leg muscles, yeah. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yes, probably. I know that time is yes. <laughs> getting short. Um, you know, we used to do wake-up tests a lot in the past. And, uh, you know, during the preoperative anesthetic reviews, you know, we teach patients how to respond and, you know, to the wake-up tests and so on. I didn't but, understand that. I'm sorry. <laughs> that, but then uh, nowadays, uh, you know, because of neuromonitoring, we don't do that anymore. So do you think that uh, by not doing this, it compromises the wake-up tests or you would still in your practice uh, instruct all patients uh, uh, about the wake-up tests beforehand? Our anesthetist does actually. Uh, so they actually tell the patient that there is a risk of wake-up test for every deformity surgery uh, mm -hmm. and teach them and how to, you know, what sort of thing they should expect uh, when we do a wake-up test. I have to say it is fairly unusual for us to do that nowadays, um, but it has happened. Uh, and I would say probably it happens maybe once every two years or something like that. So um, yeah, so we, we do teach them what to expect and what, what, what things they should do. And it probably, I think it helps for them to know uh, if it happens beforehand um, I don't know what, how much of a vague memory they have of the wake up test when they eventually wake up. So it's good to warn them uh, during, uh, before uh, the surgery and also during the consent. Uh, and it's also important for the parents to know, I think. I think that's also another important aspect when we're obtaining the consent and telling them beforehand. Um, because even though eventually, I think, you know, most of the cases will you know, there, nothing untowards has happened, uh, but the fact that a wake-up test has happened, uh, and we do we do normally tell the parents that we did that uh, if we've done it, uh, then if they know knew beforehand that this was one of the possibilities, uh, I think they feel a lot better. Yeah, Kenny, one one uh, quick quick question: Do you uh, have any complication from this neuro monitoring? Uh, pin sites or uh, application sites, like uh, for example, hair loss, burn, skin, uh, or other complications related to neuro monitoring. Um, no, I have to say no. I haven't really uh, seen any complications from the needles that we use. So we use needles. Yeah, I, I haven't seen any. I don't know. Have you had? Is that why you want? Why? why you yeah, asking? yeah. I think there is. Uh, we have a patient with loss of hair. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I do as well. And we, we routinely counsel for all these potential complications. Yeah. Okay. Like but yeah, burn over the skin area, mm. loss of hair, and uh excessive uh uh what I call uh, electrical stimulation causing uh teeth uh, complication and joint complications. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Kenny. So I think we'll go on to the next speaker. Um the next speaker will be 
from Dr. Ajoy Shetty, who will be presenting on complication avoidance in scoliosis surgery. Greetings. I'm Dr. Ajay Shetty from Ganga Hospital, Coimbatore. At the outset, my sincere thanks to the APSS Education Committee and Dr. Vishal for giving me this opportunity. My talk is on complication avoidance in scoliosis surgery. <clears throat> the primary goal of management of scoliosis is to optimize coronal and sagittal correction, avoid further curve progression, and to preserve the motion segments. It's important at the end we have a good radiological outcome in terms of a balanced spine, the head centered over the pelvis. The upper and the lower end instrumented vertebra are properly positioned and there is a good coronal correction. And also important when we look in the lateral view, a good sagittal plane restoration of thoracic kyphosis and lumbar lordosis. However, if you see in this case example, the thoracic kyphosis is not restored and the lumbar lordosis similarly is not restored. And this is can lead to a chronic low back pain scenario. It's also important that clinically, we have a good outcome in terms of a balanced neck, shoulder, a good cosmetic scar, and a decrease in the rib hump and other aspects. Therefore, the, the, the main outcome in scoliosis surgery to have a good radiological and clinical outcome. But unfortunately, this is not always we get. We may have a situation where there could be a neck tilt, a shoulder imbalance, or adding on, which can complicate the reserves. The complications in the AL surgery, the overall complication rate is 7.6%, but however, the major complications like death, neurological deficit, and vision loss is significantly lesser. The reoperation rates are significantly decreased in the last decade. And if you look at the complications, the significant complications are infections, pseudoarthrosis, and curveboard progressions. Coming to the most important thing in the surgical management of AS to reduce complication is proper planning, identification of the problem, and to identify which are the structural curves, and to decide when we plan to operate, do it right. AS is a diagnosis of exclusion. Therefore, a good clinical evaluation, a physical evaluation, and look for subtle signs of neurological deficit in the form of absent uh, abdominal reflex is important. It becomes important, especially when there are very few signs of hyperligament laxity. And this is important to identify because a selective thoracic fusion in a patient who has got hyperlaxity or hypermobility can lead to a failure of your fixation or adding on. When you look at the radiograph, look for atypical curves. AAS, as we are aware, is a S-shaped curve. And in the atypical curves, it's important to identify so that the management principles vary. The most important aspect before we consider a patient for surgery is to have a good clinical evaluation because it gives us an idea about the structural actually of the curve. We do know that the right thoracic curve, the right shoulder is at a higher level. When you clinically find the left shoulder is at a higher level, it implies that the proximal thoracic curve is structural. And also the uh, <clears throat> importance of the fact that whenever there is a loin prominence, it indicates that the lumbar curve is probably more structural. There is a significant rotation element to it. And probably we may need to include the lumbar curve in the fixation whenever when you are thinking in terms of a type 1C, a curve, or probably whenever we are thinking in plan, whether to include a lumbar curve in your fixations. Therefore, the most important aspect, whenever you are planning a scoliosis surgery, to get everything right is planning the fusion levels. But the most important thing, even though there is a general rule that include all the structural curves in, in, in the fixation, in the fusion, in terms of a, a idiopathic scoliosis, the treatment should be initialized, take into account the different characteristics, not only the radiological characteristics, but also the clinical characteristics. And that's very, very important. To give you a brief about the upper instrumented vertebral planning, we do know that when the left shoulder is up, you go up to T2. When the right shoulder is up, you go to T4. And T3, when the levels are short, are equal. But this is a general guideline which was put forward by Professor Suk. But however, we do know that there are various other factors that place uh, the important role, the magnitude and the rigidity of the proximal thoracic curve, 
the kyphosis of the proximal thoracic curve, the rotation, the direction of the T will tilt and others. Similarly, when you come to the LIV, the most common used concept is use the CSPL and the test and the last test vertebra. But also, it's important to look at the magnitude of the lumbar curve, the rigidity of the lumbar curve, the characteristic of the caudal lumbar vertebra, and that is whether it is rotated, and what is the flexibility of the disc caudal to the proposed LIV. The major important thing whenever we are thinking of fixation is to preserve the distal discs. And we try to aim as much as three distal discs should be preserved so that in the long term, the patient is relatively comfortable. Coming to the next important aspect is looking at the scar. The line of incision would be curved or straight, curvilinear. Curve is straight one is always preferred. Curvilinear, you might consider a curved, a mildly curved along the convexity of the curve when the curve is of greater magnitude above 90 degrees. It's always important to avoid a scar as in a situation like this. It's if you are planning your fixation at the point of T4 or T3, it's important that you are two or three centimeters proximal to it as per the skin incision is concerned. Handling is important as subcutaneous stitches are well preferred. When you drape the patient adequately exposed enough so that you can see the neck and the proximal part so that you can feel it intraoperatively to see that at the end you are properly balanced. The exposure should be subperiosteal, but here a word of caution, as you are coming to the upper end of your construct or, in, uh, or dissection, maintain the midline, the supraspinous, interspinous ligaments. And this is very, very important for you to prevent a PJK. PJK and DJK are relatively uncommon in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, and most of the time is hydrogenic. If you damage the midline structures proximally, if you damage the facet joint proximally, and when you use an instrumentation, which is uh, uh, fixation is not adequate enough and there's a lot of stress between these two, the, the fixed and the non-fixed areas. At the end of the procedure, it's important to do a checklist, the screw position, balance, shoulder level, UIU and LIV, and the length of the rod. As you can see in this picture, the length of the rod distally is impinging upon the facet joint distally. And this is one of the causes for failure. I mean, it puts a stress of adjacent segment degeneration. You can have a distal junction failure. You can have a poor fixation if the screw is not put properly directed, and this can lead to failures and the screw pull out. It's important at the end of your fixation, you visualize whether the inferior end plate of the LIV, the superior end plate of the UI are there parallel, or even the T1 has to be uh, parallel. There is no angulation. And if you find there is an angulation, it's better to distract. I prefer to evaluate this very carefully after I put in my first main rod and then make any adjustments with it and be look before I put in my second rod and do the final adjustments after the both the rods are in place. <clears throat> to be sure that you have done a good fixation, use a T-bar as a CSVL. And then when you place it across, you can visualize that the upper end of the construct is within the CSVL. And this uh, is very, very important because most of us do not have intraoperative radiographs inside the operation theater. And since we use CAM, this gives an idea that whether you have maintained the coronal balance following surgery. Prevention of infection is very, very important. I mean, I do not highlight the importance of using preventive care bundles in these scenarios. Fortunately, I mentioned earlier, neurological complications are very rare, and especially since the use of neuromonitoring. But one of the most important aspects is screw molecular position and releases, especially in curves, as the severity of the curves goes above 90 degrees. And in the very severe curve, it's probably better to use a halo traction or a state procedures to decrease the incidence of neurological uh, deficits. And neurological deficits happens when you are doing more of a correction manual, and especially in a stiffer curve. The most common complications you can face apart from cross neurological deficit is pedicle screw malposition. Fortunately, most of them are lateral breaches, but however, if the screws are very long, you can have vascular or neurological issues. It's important that in the upper thoracic spine, don't be tempted to put very long screws of 35 or 40 mm. It's better to use limit the screw diameter to 25 or 30 millimeters of mercury. And if you have the access to navigation, and we do know that it reduces the incidence of problems. Coming to pseudoarthrosis, I mean, the incidence of pseudoarthrosis is significant left, sir, in cases with AIS, especially with the current segmental instrumentation, with the good uh, rigid fixations. 
But most importantly, you maintain a good biological environment, use bone graft, and this becomes very, very important if you have done release procedures, like probably a ponte osteotomy. When you have done a ponte osteotomy, it's important that you do a good stable fixation. It's better to have anchor points adjacent to the site of ponte osteotomy and probably use the local bone graft, which has got more osteogenic potential rather than using allografts at the site of ponte. It's better to use cobalt chrome grafts to achieve a better stable fixation and also to regain the sagittal and as well as the coronal balance. The, there are other important complications like coronal plane imbalance, sagittal plane imbalance, crankshaft adding on, and shoulder asymmetry, which are a huge topics by itself. And for everything for that matter, the major important is to looking at the skeletal age, plan your fusion levels so that your complication rates are lighter. Implant failure usually happens when the fusion doesn't happen. But in my experience, what I have seen, the major, major cause for implant failure is an inadequate uh, amount of fixations. Even though you are going for a strategic screw placement, it's important that you have adequate fixations proximally and distally so that they are the base. And also the rod has to be adequately counted enough. You might choose between using a cobalt chrome or titanium, depending upon your, uh, the quality of bone and the fixation that is present. Therefore, you have an option of using strategic level low density screws or a pedicle screw uh, a device. And we have shown that even low density pedicle screws provides a favorable correction, especially in majority of the cases. Maybe in a patient with a very severe neglected curves, you may have to use high density implant. You can have low density strategic, high density strategic, or a high density consecutive case, depending upon the flexibility of the curve, the severity of the curve, and the rigidity of the curve, so that uh, you will provide a good, stable, good coronal and a sagittal correction in the end. To conclude, understanding of the complications allows discussion of the risks with the families. With better understanding, training, and modern instrumentation, the complications is lesser. At the same time, a severely strong modern instrumentation can have new complications like adding on, uh, uh, decompensation, and things like that. Plan preoperatively, a good surgical technique. Fusion levels are very, very important. And if you find a problem, identify it and intervene it at the earliest. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ajoy. Maybe I start off with some Q uh, question. Um, as we know that uh, high amounts of blood loss is a potential cause of uh, many type, many complications in patients with corrective surgery. So, uh, in patients with severe deformity, um, how do you uh, ensure that the the blood loss is uh, kept minimal or do you have any strategy like uh, stage surgery you know, uh, to, to make sure that the amount of blood loss is uh, kept to optimal amount? Uh, the, the first important thing is that you have to optimize the patient. You have to be sure that preoperatively their hemoglobin levels are much higher. Uh, that's number one. Number two, maintain the MAP very low, maybe less than 90 when you are doing the exposure, putting the screws and bring it to the normal level above 90 when you are doing the corrective manoeuvres. Do a superior still uh, dissection. Use tenosmic acid. We do not, we use at a relatively lower dose, 10 milligrams per kg body weight. We don't use the higher dose, which Dr. Lenke advises of going up to 50 to uh, 100 milligrams per kg body weight. In situations when the curve is very high, like you know, a severe rigid curve or greater than 100 degrees, probably we will tend to use uh, self savers. Otherwise, usual curve of AAS of 60 to 70 degrees, the blood loss is uh, relatively very less. So, uh, Dr. Joy, in your experience, what is actually the most, when you counsel your pa patients and their parents, what is actually the most common complication you see? I mean, it's a relatively safe surgery, uh, but you know, pa parents are very scared. Yeah, I agree. For me, the most important complication in AIS is probably uh, a mild imbalance of the shoulder and the neck, which we know, even though we put in our best effort, we sometimes cannot avoid that. And most of the time, the shoulder imbalance is what we inform them. The parents are usually unaware of it. 
when we are discussing them, the comp the cosmetic problem, whatever is there. And that's what I would say. Number two, in Indian scenario, sometimes car hypertrophy could be a major concern, which mm. most of the parents are worried about. Relatively, adding on crankshaft and all those issues are relatively lesser. Shoulder and neck imbalance are probably one of the major problems which I usually uh, add follow. Okay. Any other complications that anyone here of the faculty would highlight to the parents normally? To highlight the other complications that can happen is especially if the duration of the surgery is more, is probably the laceration around the lips mm. or abrasions when the positioning is not adequate and the duration of the surgery increases about uh, six hours or so. I mean, basically it's a cosmetic surgery, therefore we have to be sure that we are preventing other cosmetic concerns. Yeah. Yeah, another complication which is slightly rare uh, that we, we in our center we have encountered is uh, superior mesenteric artery syndrome. So uh, do you have any of this case, uh, experience any of this complication or uh, what would you do if you do have this complication? Fortunately, I haven't seen a case of superior mesenteric artery syndrome. It has been reported following corrections, especially when the curves are very rigid, curves more than 90 degrees. But as per the literature, most of them do settle down with the, with the patient lying on to the left side with conservative care. Most of them do settle down, even though there have been instances when people tend to operate. Uh, fortunately, I didn't have that experience having to deal with the patient with the uh, mesenteric artery syndrome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ajoy. I think, uh, yes, we are running short of time, but we will still proceed with the next uh, speaker. Uh, uh, maybe I'll let my co-host to introduce him. Yep. So, uh, yep. Thank you, Dr. Ajoy. I know you are on your way out uh, on the flight. So thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Um, we are going to move on to the last uh, agenda on our uh, program, which is a case discussion from Dr. Wang Hong Chong from Malaysia. Hi, everyone. I would like to thank APSS for the invitation as a case presenter. I am Wang Hong Chong from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. A 15 year old girl who had attained Manaki at the age of 14 presented with right thoracic hump. There was no back pain and no neurological symptoms. She was born full term via elective caesarean section for transverse lie. Past medical and surgical history were unremarkable. Developmental milestone was normal. Neurological examination was normal. There was no neurocutaneous stigmata. Baton score was 3 out of 9. This is the erect radiographs. Proximal thoracic cop angle was 43 degrees. Main thoracic cop angle was 64 degrees and lumbar cop angle was 39 degrees. The neutral and stable vertebrae were L1. CSVL touch vertebra was T12. CSVL substantially touch vertebra was L1. Reserve was grade 1. Clavicle angle was negative 3 degrees. Cervical axis was positive 5 degrees. Coronal balance was 0 and T1 tilt was positive 10 degrees. The side bending cop angle for main thoracic was 28 degrees, proximal thoracic was 31 degrees, and lumbar was negative 3 degrees. The patient was diagnosed to have adolescent idiopathic scoliosis with a lanky 2A curve. She therefore underwent posterior spinal fusion from T2 to T12 level. This is the post-op radiographs. The main thoracic cop angle improved to 16 degrees with a correction rate of 75%. At 3 months post-op, the disc wedge angle which was the disc angle between the LIV and the vertebra below was negative 10 degrees. The lumbar cop angle was 19 degrees. On the lateral radiographs, the T10 L2 kyphosis was 23 degrees. The focal LIV to LIV plus 1 kyphosis was 11 degrees. 
and sagittal this angle was 8 degrees. At 2 years post-op, the disc wedge angle increased to negative 12 degrees. Lumbar cop angle was 18 degrees. Coronal balance was positive 18 mm. The T10-L2 kyphosis was 23 degrees. Focal LIV to LIV plus 1 kyphosis was 12 degrees. Sagittal disc angle was 8 degrees. This slide shows the progression of this wedge angle up to 2 years follow-up. Therefore, the diagnosis at this moment was distal adding on and distal junctional kyphosis following posterior spinal fusion surgery in an AIS patient. The questions that I would like to raise are, what is the cause of the distal adding on and distal junctional kyphosis? What should we do now? Shall we observe? If yes, what would be the long-term outcome? Or shall we prepare the patient for revision surgery? Thank you. Yeah, Kaylin, uh, maybe can you uh, keep the slides on uh, while we do the Q&A? Yeah, so um, maybe I, was, uh, I will ask one of the faculty mem member, maybe Professor Wong. Do you have any comments on uh, this case? Yeah, yeah I, I think... Um... This adding on is um, is uh, something that we see from time to time, and um, I, I think that one of the major reasons would be that it's not long enough. That means that uh, you know it could have stopped uh, further down. Um, this was um, the LIV here was T twelve, is that right? And then um, the the stable vertebra is or was L1. So uh, whether that additional L1 would have made a difference, I think possibly it would. Um, the other thing that uh, could happen would be what we don't see is the rotation because um, ending a T12 probably is, uh, T12 is still rotated into the curve so we're going to see, it hasn't reached the end of the kyphosis in the thoracic spine uh, at that segment. So I think that's probably one of the reasons why um, uh, this occurred, because the, I think the first neutral vertebra is L1, if I'm looking at it correctly. Um, whether the neck tilt has caused that, I think it's also a factor here. Uh, when I first, when I saw this x-ray, I was thinking maybe I should, if I've done this surgery, I'll probably have gone to T1 instead of T2. Although for uh, practical purposes and ease of surgery, uh, I sometimes compromise and help on T2, uh, but uh, with T1 so much tilted, I thought that I could have gone to T1. But whatever it is, I think it's hard to get a balanced shoulder here or neck for that matter. Uh, if you're uh, for whether you go to T1 or T2, because the proximal thoracic is usually much more rigid than the main thoracic, and you end up overcorrecting the main thoracic in relation to uh, the proximal thoracic. So whatever you do, you are likely to, whether you end at T1 or T2, you're going to end up with an uneven shoulder or T1 tilt, as long as you overcorrect the, the main thoracic. Yeah, so I think the possibility would be uh, that uh, it's fused too short, yeah, and overcorrection of the main thoracic. As far as what to do, um, I think observation is, of course, um, one of the main uh, factors. Whether it caused long-term problems, I don't think we have data. Uh, whether it caused um, long-term problems. Uh, but usually the cosmetic uh, result is not good. The patient is uh, offset to the right. There's a hump. There's usually a fairly big rib hump or where the instrumentation sticks out from the back. And I generally recommend a revision. Although I must say that um, uh, patients very often are not keen on any revision surgery uh, until much later. 
All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wong. Um, anyone else, uh, Kenny, do you have any comment on this since you're one of the faculty in this session? Yeah. Uh, no, I think Prof. Wong has uh, probably gave a quite a good uh, description of the reasons. Um, it's, uh, we, we don't, I, in my practice, actually, I don't I haven't noticed a lot of DJK. So uh, I wonder if DJK has a separate uh, course from a coronal adding on. Um, I don't know if anyone else has this experience, whether and this dog adding on is always associated with a DJK. Um, anyone else? Uh, any comment? Uh, from Fong? Yes. Uh, so I was just going to uh, say something about DJK. Um, we did, uh, uh, Dennis Hay, uh, a member of our uh, spine team, um, published, I think maybe two years ago now, a long term, a 10 year follow up on uh, posterior versus anterior. Um, but that's for lumbar curve, sorry. Uh, so that, that's probably more like PJK and not TJK. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, this, whether this could be due to posterior um, interference with uh, joints during exposure, you know, all this are, are possibly factors, you know, in a posterior approach. I'm not saying that this patient is suitable for anterior. No, I will still do posterior for this patient because it's a, is a is a is a, is a double thoracic pattern, but uh, whether um, you know um, dissection or everything else uh, could be a factor is hard to say. Now, the on the lateral view, the screws looks a bit short in the vertebral body in the last screw. I wonder whether there was any instrument failure, whether there's any backing out uh, that you could see uh, in the detailed um, uh, 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 picture, uh, a sort of um, uh, post-operative progress from. Uh, initial x-ray to last x-ray on the lateral view. Yeah, um, Dr. Chung, would you want to comment on that? Do you think there's any uh, failure of implant at the distal part of the fusion? Uh, thank you, Prof Wong, for the question. Uh, basically, based on the x-ray, uh, we couldn't see any lucidity around the screws. And uh, the, the, the only thing is that we do not have a CT scan to look for the uh, uh, screw positioning and whether there's any implant failure or not. I have a few comments, uh, Lim here. So um, yeah, number one, sure. is that I agree with the Prof Wong. I would be considering to go to T1 uh, because your proximal thoracic curve is fairly rigid uh, as opposed to your major curve, which is the uh, main thoracic curve, right? Uh, the second thing is that uh, between uh, T12 and L1, I often will uh, consider go to L1 uh, and because uh, the junctional area is a uh, T12. Thirdly, is that uh, we, we look at our adding on data, the uh, 6% uh, is the rate that we found among all our patients, among lengthy one and two. And the two factors that seems to come into play, uh, there are three, three uh, things that we identified, two from the multivariate study. One is that uh, uh, you have a hypokyphotic uh, uh, thoracic spine being corrected and you have a higher chance of uh, getting it. Then second thing, if you uh, look at the uh, how immature your spine uh, are, uh, reserve one, 0, 1, 2, 3, higher risk compared to 4 and 5. So these are the two uh, factors for multivariate study uh, analysis. And then, of course, um, the, uh, the other things uh, that uh, I would comment on is uh, once you're adding on, right, uh, we found a reciprocal relationship to a shoulder. That means that your, your body is sort of shifted to uh, one side and then it, um, the opposite side of the shoulder will try to balance it off which is making the situation uh, a bit more apparent, obviously. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so yeah. if I were to operate in this case, I would consider go to L1, I would to T1 as well uh, in the future, you know, same patients. Um, Dr. Lau, how about the, the uh, would you do anything for this patient? Um, since uh, the, the, the DGK has occurred. I mean, yeah, so uh, among the patients that we look at, uh, 100 plus patients and uh, 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 two of two patients, natural history is that you'll, you'll find this uh, DJK or PJK uh, adding on usually in the first six months or a year uh, after the uh, surgery. Uh, and after that, they tend to stabilize. Uh, and you know, of course, uh, um, in your situation, uh, I'm not sure between one and two years, is there any increase or not? Uh, in your curvature. So looking at our data, uh, they usually stabilize by about a year. 
and often they, they don't increase. The main reason of a patient going for a surgery often is a cosmetic reason uh, because of the increase of the uh, waistline uh, asymmetry. All right. Um, I think Jason is still here. Maybe uh, do you have any comments, Jason? Yeah, I think uh, that that's that's what the main point about the uh, differential correction aspect is all across Wong mentioned. So in these cases where you you see preoperatively with your vendors that it's very rigid, I would not hesitate to do more re aggressive releases, like ponties at, at those areas to try to get that uh, more uh, more. Uh, uh, balanced. Um, yeah, in, in this case, I probably would have gone to L1. Um, it, I always looked at the, uh, the CSVL accordingly, and uh, to me, that T12 was a little bit far off to be, uh, to be that safe. So especially in a patient who's relatively younger, I would probably be a, more, a little bit more aggressive, go up one level longer, and uh, that will probably be uh, much safer. Okay, just just to ask uh, all the faculty here, would would you consider bracing in this patient? I, I I don't think bracing is going to help. Yeah, so, and I doubt very much uh, girls at this age going to wear a brace for any length of time anyway. So I, I don't I don't usually recommend a brace. I've not recommended a brace. Uh, yeah, no bracing for me too. Okay, so uh, maybe Dr. Chung, will you share? Uh, uh, do you have any other? Uh, do you share the what what we have done or what is the outcome? Uh, yes. Uh, Kelly, would you mind to share the video? Thank you. Hello, everyone. Now I will present what was done in this patient. To recap this case, this patient with a lanky 2A curve developed distal adding on and distal junctional kyphosis following posterior spinal fusion surgery. We treated the patient conservatively as she was asymptomatic. We continued to follow up the patient. There wasn't much changes over time. At 4 years post-op, the disc wedge angle was negative 12 degrees. Lumbar cop angle was 16 degrees. Coronal balance was positive 8 mm. The T10-L2 kyphosis was 23 degrees. Focal LIV to LIV plus 1 kyphosis was 11 degrees. And sagittal disc angle was 7 degrees. At 7 years post-op, the disc wedge angle was negative 11 degrees. Lumbar cop angle was 17 degrees. Coronal balance was positive 16 mm. The T10-L2 kyphosis was 22 degrees. Focal LIV to LIV plus 1 kyphosis was 11 degrees. And sagittal disc angle was 7 degrees. At 10 years post-op, the disc wedge angle was negative 11 degrees. Lumbar cop angle was 15 degrees. Coronal balance was 0 mm. The T10-L2 kyphosis was 21 degrees. Focal LIV to LIV plus 1 kyphosis was 9 degrees. And sagittal disc angle was 7 degrees. Over a period of 10-year follow-up, the distal adding on did not progress or worsen. Similarly, the distal junctional kyphosis remains unchanged. Various factors had been described to be associated with distal adding on. In this patient, we think that the distal adding on could be related to skeletal immaturity with a low risk grade. The selected LIV was proximal to the last substantially touched vertebra and a positive cervical axis deviation. As for the cause of distal junctional kyphosis, in this patient, we think that it could be due to a wrong selection of LIV. The selected LIV was too proximal in this patient. What is the outcome of adding on? 
Professor Masumoto reported that there was no difference in the SRS scores. However, some authors reported patients with adding on would require revision surgery. The long-term clinical outcome was unknown. Whether to have a short fusion and good correction but with risk of adding on, or to have a long fusion or moderate correction without adding on is debatable. And this would depend on the surgeon's decision. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Chun. Uh, is there any last comments from any of the faculty? Because uh, we are running a bit late. Just uh, one or two short comments. Or if not, then I will pass over to Dr. Vishal. One, one anyway. last factor is that uh, for the adding on is that if your rods okay. are too wrong, sometimes they can cause the adding on from the inner Everton fusion, uh, which is something to be aware of. Um, okay. If I may, if I may just say something, I think that uh, sure. this experience is a uh, is uh, actually echoed by uh, many of us uh, and also Leok Lim that uh, most of the time it's a cosmetic effect in a short follow up that we have for ten years or so because. <laughs> As you know, most of the problems uh, with uh, spinal imbalance and degenerative disease comes when they are 40 or 50 years old. So it is still uh, very early on. Uh, but hopefully, even at that time, uh, this patient will have no problem. And we're all hopeful because we also have a number of patients like that where patients do not want revision because they have no symptoms at this point in time. But I'm not sure whether your last statement is, is something that we should adopt. I, I, I think that uh, saying that uh, a short uh, fusion with adding on is acceptable, you know, uh, compared to a slightly longer one with good balance. Uh, I'm not so sure I will, I'm in line with that kind of philosophy. Because I think that uh, we should uh, give the patient uh, good spinal balance and also uh, less uh, deformity, if possible. Yeah. Uh, without because adding one or two more levels of fusion is not going to give them a lot more disability, right? I mean, because this girl may not tell you that she's unhappy with the appearance all throughout, right? I mean, she may be wearing loose dresses to hide it and so on and so forth. So I'm just thinking that your last statement uh, may, may need some more thought. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. For your man. Thank you, thank you. Everyone. All right, thank you. I, yeah, okay. I, Dr. Vishal, pass over to you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you and thank you, Kenny, for bringing making it superbly interactive. And I think this is one of the really, really best seminars that I have also attended. So many learning points from all the contentious issues in scoliosis. Before we move on to the summary statement of this, I would like to invite all of you to please join us for the part two of Adolescent Idiopathic Scoliosis webinar of Asia Pacific Spine Society Education Committee, which is scheduled for the 15th of May in the second quarter of this year, where the topics are furthermore interesting and intriguing to be discussed about the surgical management of type C curves, shoulder balance, selecting the right levels, how to manage the rigid scoliosis, type five and six curves, anterior versus posterior surgery, and of course, the most contentious issue of PJK and DJK and decompensation in scoliosis. With this, I like this opportunity to thank all the faculty members who really enlightened us about various aspects about the basics and surgical planning and complication avoidance. Just to summarize a few points from the last two hours that we have been here learning, classification systems, both King and Lenke, have their own pros and cons, but make communication, treatment planning, and documentation uniform. However, the major downside being that the guideline for surgical management and selection of levels is yet to become objective and future is yet to see the AI driven comprehensive guidelines and classification systems. Let's wait for them and embrace them. Bracing as was taken by Jason uh, mentioned that the progression can be prevented in cases in selective cases where the magnitude of curve is less than 40 degrees. However, weaning of bracing is another contentious issues. And of course, compliance is something that has to be ensured for it to be effective. Corrective maneuvers uh, include release, facetectomies, implant-related maneuvers. However, one should be cautious using implant-related maneuvers and shall primarily rely on the release of deformity before correction maneuvers are applied and choosing correct levels cannot be overemphasized while planning the right corrective maneuvers for AIS correction. 
Anterior growth modulation, as Prof. Wong mentioned, is a useful procedure in patients with less than 50 degree and yet flexible curves among patients who have growth potential remaining. However, newer surgeries with newer problems and newer salvage options are still evolving and shall not be overused. Patient selection remains the key in such patients. Neuromonitoring and its importance in spinal deformity surgery cannot be overemphasized because combined NMEP and CCP not only helps you to predict neural insult, but also reversal mechanisms are well defined and can prevent the imminent deficit. Almost nil false positives have been reported so far, and it is absolutely the standard of care today. Complications to the tune of 1 to 7% are known in AIS surgery. Of course, avoidance mechanisms should be in checklist and should be followed stringently. Correct level selection, correct clinical examination, right patient choosing, which in turn is decided by radiological and clinical parameters using classification systems is absolutely mandatory. Guidelines of curve fusion based on structural curves and flexibility is very important. And yet, we can still land up into problems of PJK and DJK as was emphasized in our case discussions in last two cases that our faculty mentioned. With this, I would not only thank all the faculty members, the APSS Education Committee headed by Prof. C.C. Wong, and also our professor and head and president of APS, Dr. Raj Shekharan, for being motivating us to bring forward these webinars, which we'll continue doing so. Looking forward to host you for the second webinar. Thank you all, and thank you, Medtronic, for being a great, great support in not only enlightening us and allowing us to conduct these webinars on a continuum basis for this whole year, where we are going to have four such webinars coming up in this year on scoliosis itself. Thank you so much. Uh, back to Kailin again for the proceedings. Kailin, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Vishal, and thank you to all faculties. We would like to um, give a very short announcement that the abstract submission is now open for the APSS annual meeting 2022 with live operative course happening this June 10 to 12, 2022 in Ganga Hospital. So please submit your abstract. It is open until 15 March. We look forward to your sum uh, abstract submission. Thank you very much. Thank you and bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. bye.